Hey, Cesar. Hey, hello. Good hello. morning. Can you hear us well? Yeah, yeah perfect. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, very busy, but uh, but good, good. Like uh, building systems and new business right. models and new new stuff. Lots of lots of stuff happening. Okay. Would love, would love to hear about it. Is that with the maker? Uh, what is it called? The maker bay. Uh, yeah, we. Um, uh, this is not about the HKU, but with Maker Bay, we we uh, signed a contract with the uh, Cambodia, so we are planning now to build this uh, largest like innovation space in uh, in Phnom Penh. Wow, nice. And, yeah, so it's good, but then the, the the it's a pretty dire situation over there. Like we're su supporting startups, and ninety percent of them have uh, said that they have frozen their activity during the virus, right, uh, right. which is crazy because you guys are startup, but you keep operating, you know, yeah. because you're mostly online, and uh, and I think. A lot of the startups in Cambodia are also online. So I'm really like, how how could they be halted to 90% if they are online? Like they should they should be more resilient, if anything. Like they're not agriculture. Or... I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's it's. Uh, I mean, I understand. In some cases, it can be really hard if you're like uh, with physical objects, right, and so on, right. like con construction startups or something. Maybe depends but... on the industry as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys are very hands-on, right? It's, it's, yes. it's a maker space, obviously. So it's right. a little bit different, right? Well, yeah, we, we did lose 90% uh, of our business in uh, February, March, though. So, uh, so that, was, uh, that was a pretty hard hit. But we managed to transfer 30% of that loss online. So it means that we managed to say, OK, you cannot yeah. come to our workshop. What about we, uh, we deliver to you some tools and some materials, and we conduct it remotely. And 30% of them were willing to do that. Actually, yeah. more of them could have done it, but culturally, they were just not ready or willing to uh, to make the shift. I think technically it's possible, but they are like, no, we don't want it. What, so, what do you? What, what did you exactly do online? Like, what did you move to? Yeah, what are you doing online? Well, for instance, like if you do like a design thinking workshop, um, that's much easier to to send them. Like, we, they could buy post-its, or we could just like ship them a box of like paper and stickers and paper, mm -hmm. scissors, and tape. That's possible. Uh, but if we do like a uh, woodwork, then we have to ship uh, like, you know, pliers and clamps and wood right. sails. Oh, wow. and, okay, okay. So and you've, like, tried, you've already done that. You've tried like that. So that model where you ship things to them ahead of the... Yeah, we tried that on a small scale and it was moderately successful. Uh, we are rolling, we are getting ready to roll it out on a much larger scale with a much better equip equipment. And uh, we actually uh, will start discussion with universities to supply them so that next year we could supply HKU, but also other universities to, to do all the, so like electronics kits and um, like sewing kits and biology kits. Um, it's quite expensive, but it's it's not unaffordable. Yeah, I was going to say it must be quite costly to provide it individually, because I guess in the workshops you had things that could be shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if the campus was more flexible, they could repurpose some of their space because the, the cost of space is incredibly high in Hong Kong. And so if a lot of the classes are not happening in person, so, um, but they're not very quick on their feet because it's so big and there's so much inertia. Um, for us, we could say, we're gonna move our business to a new location that is smaller, for example, uh, or we could go to people's house or to schools instead of them coming to us for like crowd restrictions. Uh, yeah. So we can adapt very fast, but university, pretty slow. <laughs> for sure, sure. Yeah. I guess that's how they are, generally. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I have to also keep my private interest, my company interest separate from the, 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 the school because it's illegal for me to like trying to sell service yeah. to, right, uh, right. so I have to kind of do double the work and trying to think with the university how they can do it on their own, even if I have my own solution. And sometimes I would have to like recommend them other suppliers when even if I have a better yeah. solution in my opinion. Yeah, yeah so it's, uh, it's tricky. <laughs> How do you manage your time as well with it? So you, you're not teaching full time then? Uh, yeah, I'm teaching full time, but uh, two days are like face to face with the students and then three days are, are research. So the three days, basically, I do a lot of my research in, in, my, in my startup. So Ocean Robotics with the scout bots and we're doing good progress on core reef mapping. And then the other one is uh, Makeaway just running the operations. So. But I have people in both companies, so I'm not by myself. Like a lot of people are. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Cesar, just before we start, uh, we were discussing with, with Zera. I didn't actually manage to look it up, so I'll ask you. Um, were you involved with the Fukushima cleanup in any way? Yeah, I've gone to Fukushima uh, three times to, uh, to measure radioactivity. Um, sure. 
uh, was mostly focused on ocean radioactivity. So I, w I focused right, my right, effort okay. on. So I was I was kind of the arm of ocean radioactivity for safe casts. Okay. Yeah. Please, um, uh, I'm gonna get my headset because I cannot hear you very well. But not the like the actual building. I mean, the building cleanup is, is heavy duty stuff. That's sorry, sorry about. Uh, yeah, I, I was just saying that the building cleanup itself is like really heavy duty. Like you need like heavy protection. It's really bad. So, I, so I guess it's more like the in the coastline cleanup, right? Yeah, it's really tricky. Yeah, I was just reading. Um, I was just reading a report saying that the politics that Trump is doing with COVID resemble the Chernobyl uh, way that uh, Russia or well, kind of Ukraine like dealt with uh, sending human robots for sacrifice. Right. Mm. You know, like uh, Japan didn't really um, they, they they measure the economic value, uh, the economic impact, and they said, well, it's. At the beginning, they said it was too expensive to evacuate people, and then they had to evacuate people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. Concept. I was there exactly one month. Robots. Oh, hello. I went. I went there exactly. <laughs> oh, I went there exactly one month after it happened, actually, to Fukushima. Oh my gosh! Why? Uh, well, no, I didn't go to Fukushima. I went to Tokyo. I should say. Yeah. Oh, I see. But, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a big difference. It, it, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Bit of a difference. Yeah. Well, uh, about a month. But, a month after it happened, there was a risk that Tokyo would be evacuated. The, the, uh, well, yeah, so, somewhat. Maybe not all of Tokyo, but yeah, there was some, definitely some risk. I, I went with a Geiger counter, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had to, had to, yeah, yeah, exactly. You should. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, should we get started? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so I prepared some visuals. So. Um, so I'll announce the start of the class and how I think to conduct it. But, but please, like, if you think there's a there's a better way, another way, I'm I'm uh, very open to yeah. it. So we we have some slides that we want to go over. A couple of short videos we want to show as well. Some some a couple of things. But uh, why don't you yeah why don't you start it up? Yeah. So uh, welcome everybody for the students. Um, I would like everybody to show their videos. Um, so right now, none of you are showing the videos. That's not what we need to do. Please uh, open your videos. So um, yeah, otherwise it's just uh, otherwise we're just pre-recorded and there'll be no interaction. It's not it's not cool. Thank you. Uh, so the run of the day that I have in mind is to go through the stories so that you can get to to hear. Oh no, sorry. You you don't have you only have an hour. So maybe you you do you start, and then after that we'll go through the stories. Uh, because then you, you probably just stay with us about an hour, right? Uh, maybe a little more, maybe a little okay. over an hour. But yeah. Uh, okay, so then we'll start with you, and then we will go for the student stories. If you want to stay, you can stay. If you need to go, you can go. Uh, and then I'll, I'll have some content as well about how to turn, turn stories into objects and vice versa. Um, we'll take a small break in the middle as well after, after, your, after your, your sharing. Uh, Wendy, uh, Bavisha, uh, Oscar. Uh, Yan Shun Wong, if you can remove your filter, uh, or oh, Carson, uh, and then Anson, if you can share your camera, that'd be helpful. We are missing a few people, aren't we? One, two, so now we have nine, twelve. Oh, we have eleven people. I think we're missing. Oh, yeah, Fergal is missing. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so because you mentioned we're going to start with you, so I'm just going to go and change the order of the slides. So I'm just gonna go and put neural tools at the beginning. Okay. So we haven't added hours into the into the flow, into that slide deck. So if you want after this, we can add them there. So they're all oh. in one place. Okay, that's great. If you can, that'd be, that'd be perfect. So this we, we can really uh, share with the students as well. So um, then I'll let you kick it off then. If you wanna talk, if you have some content right. to share. Let me just put my screen. Thank uh, you. Okay, so that's going to stop your sh screen sharing. Oh, sorry, yes. Let me, let me know when you can see the screen. We can. Okay. All right. So let me move this out of the way. Okay, so I, you know, as you know, we're mined, and uh, we'll show you kind of where we're at, where we are, and where we're going. And let's start with the matrix because I think this is uh, worth seeing just the first a couple of minutes, two minutes or so, of this video. Actually, maybe the first minute is enough. <gasps> Holy shit. 
Can you guys hear it? Yeah. Okay, so you guys have probably seen this before. Has um, oops, a sec. So before we go to the next one, uh, and we tell you a little bit about kind of what we've built and what we're working on. Maybe a question like, how real is this, and what would it take to actually make this kind of happening in reality? Like, what would it take for, for this sure. to to be? Real? Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously this is, you know, sci-fi, it's the matrix. It's just a, it's a fun and interesting movie, but we are headed very much in that direction. I'll show you some examples um, from, I think one of your students uh, says that they, they have a slow internet. Anyway, uh, so, so, you know, we're, we're headed in this direction. Actually, we're much closer to this now than, you know, you might think like, pro, you know, we're looking like at 2040, we're going to have, some version of this. I mean, already we have the very, very early prototypes and experimental settings. And I'll show you some of that in a bit. I mean, we looked at it briefly. We skimmed over it, I think, uh, two sessions back, or maybe also, was it the first session? Yeah. Maybe we briefly looked at some, some things. So let's look at another video. This one's a little bit longer. Let's watch the whole thing just for five minutes, just to give you a, a bit more of a kind of a structured background on brain computer interfaces so that you understand some of the rest of it. It's uh, Face it. Your brain is a computer. Okay, there's one difference. While our brains need water to function, it would destroy a computer CPU. But all joking aside, what if our brain was actually connected to a real computer, which analyzed our brain activity to enhance the performance of, let's say, car brakes? Sounds like science fiction. It's real. One, two, three, four. All around the world, scientists are working on developing so-called brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs. Simply put, devices that convert brain activity into control signals. The electrical brain signals are recorded, analyzed by a computer, and then translated into precise instructions. Tech giants like Facebook and Tesla announced a while ago that they are investing in this technology. So, what exactly are brain-computer interfaces? What does the future hold for BCI technology? And are we in control of the ethical ramifications? Let's take a look. The term brain-computer interface is used for devices which enable a user to interact with a computer by means of brain activity only. In other words, a BCI translates neuronal information into commands that are capable of controlling external software or hardware. It does so by using Bear with me, electroencephalography, better known as EEG. The method lets you record electrical activity generated by the brain via electrodes placed on your head. BCI doesn't read the mind accurately, but it detects even the smallest changes in the energy radiated by the brain when you think in a certain way. A BCI recognizes specific frequency patterns in the brain. It's basically communication without any use of muscle power. The idea to use impulses for communication is used in other fields as well. Let's take road traffic, for example. Electronic systems save lives every day. An airbag reacts to an accident in fractions of a second, and electronic stability programs can help us survive critical situations. American startup BrainCo is taking this idea some steps further. They are trying to reduce the risk of accidents in production plants using BCIs. The headband measures the brain waves of the workers. It registers concentration deficits and stops the machine in the event of a lack of attention. BCI could change the way people think, soldiers fight, and Alzheimer's is treated. Research in that field is going crazy at the moment, with all the big players wanting in on brain-computer interface technologies. Facebook plans for a game-changing BCI technology that would allow for more efficient digital communication. 
to be honest, I'm not so sure if I should trust Facebook when it comes to my brain. What about you? But also someone else caught worldwide attention with his PCI plans. Recently, Tesla co-founder Elon Musk entered the industry. He announced a 24 million euro investment in Neuralink, a venture with a mission to develop a PCI that improves human communication in light of artificial intelligence. More specifically, Neuralink is aimed to bridge the gap between humans and AI by implanting tiny chips that link up to the brain, all controlled by a smartphone. There are even rumors circulating of an app store for the brain. As a first step, Neuralink wants to enable motor impaired persons to operate devices only by thinking. A clinical study is scheduled to start in 2020. According to research experts, the global BCI market will grow by at least 10% annually to more than 1.5 billion euros by 2022. So it's likely that you'll hear a lot more about BCIs in the future. The development of BCIs is not only about technical aspects. Scientists and businesses are also concerned with the question of digital ethics around the technology. For example, at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Here, a team of international neuroscientists has formulated ethical guidelines for the use of BCI technology. These guidelines are intended to guarantee data protection, liability and security in brain control systems. The central demands of neuroscientists include a veto function that interrupts unintentional commands, protection against unauthorized mind readers, and secure data encryption. Researchers warn against the dangers of so-called brain hacking. According to scientists, special caution is required with implantable systems. In extreme cases, manipulation of these systems in order to influence brain functions or behavior cannot be ruled out. What do you think? Do you think BCI technology is a revolution or does it scare you? And would you get a chip implanted in your brain if it helped you optimize yourself? Let us know in the comments. All right, so that's, that's that. Did you guys manage to hear that? Um, it was pretty good for me. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, right, so that's a little bit of a background on BCI. So hopefully we're kind of all on the same page with the basics. Uh, you know, it's, it's looking at brain signals. Uh, for, you know, it's looking at electrical activity usually from your brain. There's different types of uh, BCIs that I'll show you briefly. So currently right now, you know, um, you, you have these big MRI scanners um, and you, you know, the head goes in there and you can kind of get uh, a sense, you can get actually very accurate uh, readings. But that's, you know, it's a big device. Like you have to actually lie on this thing and your head goes in there. You have this EEG caps in a research setting and, you know, uh, some of them look like this, some of them look like they have like 256 channels or 256 of these. Uh, and they look even crazier, you know, and it's, uh, it's not very convenient in a research to take the, like, so this is in a research setting, right? But already in like a consumer setting, you have devices like this. Uh, and at the company at Mind, we use uh, some of these devices for, uh, no, actually, I'll explain to you kind of how we make use of that. Um, this is the Motive Insight. This is the Motive Epoch. These, so this one costs about $400. This one is similar, about $300 also dollars. This one's a little cheaper. It's like $200, $250. Um, it's less uh, useful in that it only reads from the front of the brain, but it's easier to set up. And all of these things you can more or less just put on. This one's a little more of a hassle to put on, but this one and this one you can kind of just put on and they start reading your brain activity. So when you read the brain activity, you can then take those signals, complex signals, you run that through AI, and then you can start to make predictions in many cases, quite accurate about the person's mental state, right? So actually, let me, let me put this on so I can see some of you. Uh, and so what that means is when you wear one of these, you can actually control a game, for example, and this is already used. Like if you get one of these devices and to play with yourself, you can actually control some things in the game. So with a little bit of training with one of these devices, which is a little bit better than the other guys with one of these, you can actually learn to control a drone in 3D, right? Either a virtual drone or a virtual character of some kind of flight, let's say like a drone or in a real drone in the real world, you can actually learn to control it in three-dimensional space by imagining certain things. So usually, just to be clear, right now, 
when these devices, it's not like they read your, um, it's not like they read your actual thoughts, but they read higher, slightly more general patterns of activity. So for example, they can tell if you're focused or not. They can tell if you're in a good mood generally or not. Uh, they can tell if you're very sleepy, you know, that, that sort of thing. So it's a little bit more general. It's not like they can, in some cases, they can tell whether you're thinking about certain types of things. So if you're thinking about, for example, numbers, as opposed to animals, that they can, uh, you can, you can do that as well with, uh, with slightly better headsets, uh, probably with this one after some training, probably not with this one uh, or this one. Okay, uh, but when you think actually about brain computer interfaces, uh, and kind of the brain and interfacing with the mind for like mental well-being or mental performance, like monitoring these things in a Martian setting. Don't just think about brain computer interfaces as such. Think a little bit more broadly about like interfacing with the mind through the body, right? We talked about that in the first session and we talked a little bit about sensors. So like all of these guys, all of these guys can actually measure your heart rate, uh, kind of the variability in your heart rate. The heart rate variability then is a measure of stress, actually. Uh, you can extract a measure of stress from that. So this is a ring. It's a pretty cool little ring that you can buy. And then just a Fitbit, this Apple Watch. You guys have seen those. There's also other ways you can measure these things. You can actually use your webcam. You can use uh, these glasses that measure your uh, pupil size or where you're looking. You can even use your phone for measuring your stress level, your heart rate variability and your stress level. And it actually works decently. So the point is all, the, all these different ways you can, you can uh, measure your stress level in different aspects of emotional, emotional states. There is also galvanic skin response. Uh, this is a glove that was made at MIT. Actually, Cesar, you probably know this, right? The, yes. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can buy ones like this that kind of uh, go on your wrist. There was even a gaming mouse. Uh, I, I actually have this one. Um, so if any of you are gamers, this actually measures your heart rate variability and your galvanic skin response. So this measures two different aspects of your physiology. These are different ways of interacting. It doesn't just have to be in your brain, right? So that's one way, but it's obviously a little invasive, the BCI stuff. Um, and before we get there, you know, we'll go through this phase of having all sorts of different devices. And that's kind of the phase we're at right now. Uh, Cesar briefly, uh, well, you, you know, during the first session, I think he pointed out to you that we can already modify brain activity. These are two devices that exist today. I have this one. I have a few other ones, actually. I don't have this one, though. Uh, and basically, you put these on, and they run a little electrical current through your brain. And that changes how you feel. It changes how, how focused you are. And it has very specific effects that you can, um, that you can elicit in people. And, and these things more or less work. They work better for some people and not as well for other people, but they more or less work. They're really affordable too. Like you can buy this one for, I don't know, it's about $400. Yeah, so it's not, it's not too bad. So, uh, yeah. just, so these don't actually read your activity, right? So these right. are like stimulating to do something. So the first set of tools, that's for understanding and reading what's going on inside your brain. Whereas this one is actually to stimulate certain parts once you know what you want to stimulate. Yeah, so these guys or these guys they read activity they read activity from your brain uh, you can think of it as like uh, output from your brain and then these guys are inputs to your brain they can actually change your brain activity and they can make you feel a certain way uh, perform better or worse uh, things like that so we're not going to watch all of this just briefly going to show you that leads to this concept that's actually behind the word before i tell you kind of um what we've built and how we go about doing this, uh, you should understand this concept of biofeedback, which is basically where you take signals from the body, and that can be brain signals. It, it says here brain activity EEG, if you can see it. It can be muscle signals through EMG. It can be heart rate signals uh, through you know a wearable or an ECG or something. It can be breathing signals, skin conductance, all these different signals. So you can take any of these, and then you can build a system uh, in some cases driven by AI, doesn't have to be, that then changes something about the environment to help you regulate your body or your brain activity, if that makes sense. So let me, let's just watch this for one minute. And the physiological it activity sense. that is going on inside your body and nervous system is a process that is constantly changing, moving and responding. It responds to what happens in the outer world around you 
but also to your inner world of thought, perception, and emotion. Indicators like heart rate, respiration, blood circulation, body temperature, and others adjust themselves constantly based on the feedback they get from the body's inbuilt sensors to find the optimal balance and state. These vital rhythms define your very life, your health, wellness, and performance. But what if this activity is out of balance? Many modern health problems, such as tension headaches, stress-related anxiety, hyperventilation, high blood pressure, and forms of chronic pain, as well as attention and mental performance problems, stem from neurobiological dysfunctions, as well as from behavior and lifestyle patterns. In that case, we should not simply only rely on pills and medication. Lifestyle, stress, or in other words, behavior, can also be a cause for health and performance problems. Many researchers, clinicians, and health professionals are becoming increasingly interested to understand the role of the human nervous system and behavior in health and performance. This is the exciting scientific field where psychology and physiology meet. Biofeedback and neurofeedback refer to technology which enables us to literally see what the body is doing in real time. It's like having a mirror in which we can see the physiological signals of the mind-body system. And this enables us to notice and learn how to gain control over our physiological state, our stress levels, attention and performance. So does that make sense before we go on uh, any questions on it on this? Does that more or less conceptually make sense? I mean, it's uh, the details uh, are a little, yeah. I have a question which is a bit more philosophical, but maybe uh, maybe something that um, that when I watch this kind of video makes me makes me feel reminds me of a conversation I had was um, um, some people uh, when. They, um, they, they, they would describe humans as a pile of flesh and as a complex, comp like a series of computation. Yeah. And some, some people would describe that. And on one hand, yes, it is, it is true in the sense that, okay, you could, you could have like a reductionist approach and just look at that. But then some other people are, are very shocked by this approach, which is very dehumanizing. You know, like uh, it feels that it's removing, you know, a, a, like a whole dimension of the human, which yeah. is beyond our capacity to understand, uh, which is emotional, is spiritual, and um, so. So, how do you feel uh, the, the those two things interact? Like, do you feel that it's necessary to have a reductionist approach in order to advance science and you know how we run a society, or do you think yeah. it's important to have like an inclusive approach and be and being uh, cognizant of, of how much, how little that we understand. So, so Cesar, I think it's all of those. I think those are not mutually exclusive, right? Right. So yeah. you, you, you said, for example, reductionist, if by that you mean in a uh -huh. kind of very literal sense, reducing things to their subcomponents yes. and, and understanding those, that probably won't give you a, a very good understanding of the overall system, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think you know, nowadays, a lot more people are, are thinking in a systems way, right? So like understanding the connection between systems and so on. If you mean, if, so what do you mean by reductionist? Let's, let's get that out of, out of the way. Yeah, sure. I think the reductionist, I mean, um, for example, like, uh, is this something if you say pizza is just like dough and tomato and you kind of uh, ignore the, the labor that's gone into it or like the education of the, of the cook? Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, I, I feel it's a, it's a way to reduce the, the actual value of something by just like um it's just the, the, it's more than the sum of the parts if you are. i think it's just looking at the parts yeah, instead yeah. of yeah 
so so yeah i mean agree that's that there there has been a tendency like that right in, in a lot of science and a lot of fields i think it, we're slightly moving away from that uh towards what i call an ecological view right which yeah. is a systems type of thinking right where you think okay you don't think about the system in itself but how it interacts with everything else around it right and i think that to me that's a very spiritual view actually right that's kind of like that's where you start to think okay well in what sense uh you know, in what sense is my brain connected to the air I breathe? Well, in many ways, right? So the carbon dioxide levels, the oxygen levels and so on, and those in turn are affected obviously by the trees and the other people around me, right? And so you, you start kind of, you can, you can have this kind of uh, more wholesome way of seeing things. Uh, I mean, I, I think it is a philosophical discussion. I think it's also a practical discussion. And to me, it's like, um, it doesn't, you, the, the wrong way in my opinion to approach it is to say, if you, the better you understand a system, the less uh, spiritual, or the less somehow you know beautiful it is. I, I, that doesn't right. make sense to me. You know? Right. And and the, the whole computational thing that you mentioned, it's uh, that that also isn't mutually exclusive, right? It's uh, it's just one way of modeling and understanding a system, and you can understand it at many different levels levels of abstraction, right? So there, there, you will never, practically never, understand you know, all of us on a quantum mechanic, like there's no point to simulate a human being on a quantum mechanical level, right? It's, there's a lot of details. I, I mean, say you're trying to understand uh, behavior. It's probably not useful to simulate the uh, electrodynamics of, you know, the electrons and the protons in, in all of the human body. It's not very useful probably, right? Um, so different levels of abstraction, right? Like when you talk about computational stuff, it's very useful if you're looking at large scale brain, uh, functional brain networks, right? and how they talk to each other and these rhythms that you pick up with EEG, for example, that's very useful where kind of computation, machine learning, all these things you can like useful in the sense of you can do useful things with it, right? Thank you. Uh, other question from the students? Has anyone, has anyone played uh, with any of these devices at all? I mean, I'd be surprised if you guys have played with kind of BCI EG headsets. But have any of you used, some of you might have an uh, Apple Watch. Have any of you used, had an Aura Ring or a Fitbit? Well, I can't really see all of you, so this is a bit tricky. I have to keep cycling. Erica, you, you're nodding your head? Yeah, um, I have an Apple Watch. Cool, what do you use it for? Uh, when I go for runs, but now I don't leave the house, so it's out of battery. <laughs> right, right. So, so just for runs, but you know, it actually, you can, you can use it for quite a bit more and uh, it measures your stress level as well. So do you, have you ever used it for that, for example? Oh no, I didn't know it did that. Right, right. Okay. I, I, I don't know if that counts, like Apple Watch has a, like a brief function, I guess, because I also use Apple Watch. I think so, sometimes... Sorry, catch that. What function? Uh, a brief function. Oh, breathing, like, yeah, like yeah, meditation. It would, kind of it, yeah, it will tell you to breathe sometimes, like when you're in stress, like the watch thing you're in stress. And yeah, you, so that's a kind of biofeedback, right? Because actually, I, I think it tunes the breathing, or is it always the same? Is it always the same pattern for breathing, or does it tune it based on your movement? I think most of these watches, I don't have an Apple Watch, but I think the Apple Watch tunes the colors and the breathing pattern based on how you move, how your hand moves. So it looks at your breathing basically, right? And then it gets you to breathe in a calmer and slower way, right? Yeah, I think because of watch also keep track of your like uh, heart rate and all the stuff. Exactly, I think exactly. Maybe sometimes when you are in stress, like your rate pattern is a little bit different. I guess it can analyze that and tell you that all you need to calm down. So the watch would tell you to breathe for one minute, something like that, like take a deep breath, something like that. Exactly, exactly. So that's the kind of like a basic form of biofeedback, right, that you can, that you have access to today. And then obviously, as you go up in the complexity, and as you grow in the number of devices, and you go towards the brain, you can do more and more uh, types of sensing and bio, more complex and interesting biofeedback, right? Cool. So what we're building is we're building an AI assistant at Mind. We're building an AI assistant for your mind. So the company is, you know, appropriately called Mind. Uh, there is basically that's your mind with an AI in there. There's two A's. There's a story behind that for another time, if you're interested. But it's the there is currently there. So there's AI assistants for like you know listening to music, you know Alexa, 
Google Home, but you, you don't currently have an AI assistant uh, kind of for your mental well-being, right? So, you know, we're all human uh, and, you know, some of these things have probably happened to all of us, right? So there's, uh, you know, you get angry, uh, you know, you, you binge like series, TV series, and you're like, oh, I got to finish that homework, I got to finish that project, but you just can't disengage, right? Or, I don't know, if you've fallen asleep uh, at the wheel, hopefully not. Uh, but if you go on like very long drives, like that can definitely happen. Mistakes, losing your focus when you're trying to focus on things, yada, yada, so on, right? So, yeah. Yeah, just to add, so the kind of the, the, the core problem that we really wanted to tackle is that uh, what we spoke about previously um, about our evolutionary constraints and how a lot of the times when uh, we find ourselves in these kind of situations, it's often really out of our control. And even sometimes when you feel like it's, it's a choice of ours, oftentimes it's, you know, it's our physiology that can be in a certain state. So it's this lack of awareness and um, like real understanding what's going on in our mind and our body. Um, so um, yeah, that was kind of what we wanted to bring some more awareness to people to really better understand themselves. Well, more than just bring awareness to them, we want to solve it. We want to uh, yeah. give them a tool with which they can both be more aware, but also manage all of these things better. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so to yeah. ask you, so would you reckon that there is a, so all the things that you just listed are negative and there's a positive counterpart to each of these, or do you reckon that sometimes those can be good as well? Like aggression could be good or losing focus could be good or, or. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's a great question. I think, I think it can, right. But it's, it's a, it's a question of like uh, awareness and using anger or aggression at the right time in the right situation. Oftentimes it comes in the wrong situation, right? Or too much of it or something. Mm -hmm. And so the point is that we're not like that. In a, that's a, the, the nature of emotions is that they take over your body and your mind, right? Uh, I mean, you know, you, when you're, when you're angry, like you can't think very clearly, you get stuck in certain kind of modes of uh, behavior and speech. And then you only afterwards, you become aware of what you've said, for example, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just for example, to give it like, so say mistakes, like one of the things you're looking at is in hospital, like human error is a very big problem, whether it's in space or like in hospital settings, any like critical environment. And a lot of the times it's so dependent on your physiology, where say if you didn't get enough sleep or if you didn't eat, uh, you know, that can like you have these blind spots and you, you can like it's just something beyond your control even There's, even if you're aware of it it's beyond your control right that's the that going back to the cognitive bias it's like it's large a lot of these things are playing out even if you know about them right it's like knowing about them doesn't stop the the, these these things are running. Right? I'll give two more examples actually. So another one, um, maybe some of you have heard, but uh, so there, there have been studies to look at people's judgment. So in court cases, for example, judges are a lot, uh, were given more positive uh, decisions if it was after they've had lunch, whereas the time if the court hearing is before lunch. So was it something like yeah, that? Yeah, so, like, so the judges basically were kind of- Were they, they gave, getting hungry? They gave uh, less severe sentences, um, you know, early in the day or right after lunch, but le right before lunch when they're getting hungry or glucose levels lowest, they tend to give a harsher sentences for the same type of crime. So if you ever have to go to court and you're getting sued for something, make sure that your appointment with the judges, right? Make sure your court case is right in the morning or right soon after lunch, right? It's Hopefully it doesn't happen. But yeah, just knowing, I mean, hunger is insanely, can affect so much. And, um, and another example, just quickly, um, so just maybe relating to the first picture, like reactive behaviors. Um, so again, being like biological species, right? We have male, female, and a lot of dynamics, again, evolutionary, we've evolved to... Um, you know, to have certain behaviors. And so females, we go through hormonal cycles, uh, well, both males and females, right? But for females, it's quite prominent, right? We get this once a month um, and the hormones fluctuate, but that doesn't just affect our moods and girls here, you probably familiar and some it affects more than others, but it does affect, you'll get a bit more emotional during certain cycles, but it also affects the males um, that are in your, you know, surrounding and it doesn't need to be your partner, like any male within your environment can be affected and that could make them more aggressive towards you or angry and all this stuff is going on where like none of you are aware of that. 
but then nevertheless your behaviors can be severely affected by by hormones basically of the other person right so all these different things going on even if you're aware of them what do you do right now there's not a whole lot you can do so we just talked about it right and so so there's there are a couple of things you can do today to to track different aspects of your mental state so you could wear one of these devices that we just talked about earlier uh, there are different kinds of, you know, EEG headsets, and uh, th there's a lot of very cool things you can do with them. Uh, but basically, bottom line, Will, and we looked around, there wasn't really one tool that would allow to just, you know, do something or measure it or wear it where you could get a good Yeah, should we just go through the examples? Because yeah. I'm not sure that they necessarily know these things, right? Or that they've used them. So, sorry? Yeah, we're just going to go through it. So the way that uh -huh. you'd currently do that, uh, for example, is you could do questionnaires. Um, so that's like psychometric um, questionnaires where you just answer a bunch of questions and you get a, um, an assessment. Um, that's obviously not very practical and, you know, you kind of need to go get somebody to do that. There are some available online, but they're also like quite limited um, and that's not really real time um, physiology. Um, then you have some apps that you can find to track your mood um, and Again, so like the second image here, uh, like their mood notes. There's, so there's quite a few of them on the app store and some of them are better than others, but again, a lot of them require manual input where, and it's subjective, right? So it doesn't necessarily measure what you're actually feeling, but you have to input. And sometimes that's very accurate, that they can be accurate, right? But sometimes again, you might not feel stressed, but you're, you know, you're actually stressed and vice versa. And there's also, uh, there's a lot of biases as well when we're kind of feeling and thinking about things sometimes. Um, for more objective measures, like what Martin covered earlier, there are wearables, like Fitbits, Apple Watch, um, but they're quite limited in what they show you. And, uh, you know, people like um, Erica said, like she uses it for running and most people use it for fitness and you'd look at heart rate, but again, it doesn't really tell you much about your mind state. Yeah. And anything more in depth is quite invasive and just not something you can wear or yeah, it's nothing, not practical. So to summarize, uh, there are things you can use today, right? There's apps, uh, there's devices, there's like more um, invasive or like inaccessible, let's say more complex bulky devices. And there, there are these things you can use, but they have their issues. So either they're bulky, they're complex to use, uh, or you use them for fitness, for example, in the case of, these fitness trackers like Apple Watch, Fitbit, and so on, but people don't usually use them for mental well-being and mental state tracking. You could record things manually, but uh, that has a lot of issues. It also takes time. You can do these questionnaires. They do kind of give you a sense of your me uh, of your mood, for example, or your stress level. The questionnaires can be pretty good, but um, but they uh, you know you have to do them. They takes time to do them. They're not very practical as such, right? So basically, after looking at everything what's there, we kind of wanted to approach it and think, okay, how do we approach it so that we can kind of cover everything, right? This whole kind of wholesome approach and totality of it and kind of looking at the human sys um, system, obviously it's complex and it's multimodal. So to understand uh, human behaviors, you can't just look at one aspect of that, right? So language, for uh, so yeah, we're looking at like heart rate, subjective feelings. Um, and then there's another domain which we kind of, Start explore, started exploring which is voice and language so your language is something that you use since you're born and culturally there's a lot embedded in how we communicate like and how we think um, so there's content uh, to kind of what we speak and you can actually derive a lot from the words you use so there's been some studies where they applied AI to analyze text um, and they can actually predict onset of like depression and um, other disorders from like up to is it like sometimes a, a year or something so like yours the, the the patterns in your speech and the kind of words that you use so language is very rich and we thought that that could be a nice starting point um, and then looking at actual voice quality so as I'm speaking now you know if if you didn't even see me, you could probably through intonation hear if, you know, if I was happier or, you know, if I was upset and if it's somebody you know better then you can like instantaneously kind of notice very slight changes in the voice. And that's something again that analyzing you can, you can pick up on. 
So we wanted to combine all these technologies that we have today and find a way to put them all together where you don't need to measure different things, but there's something that's very simple, very accessible, something like voice. And that just from that, you can get uh, the same quality as you would wearing this, wearing that. Um, and also one important point is the environment. The moss, that's yeah. where you're pointing. So the environment, right? So the time of the day, um, noise levels, there's a lot, a lot of research and studies. We didn't cover that um, to, um, in the presentation, but it affects um, our performance and activity mm -hmm. a lot and our mental states as well. So, you know, I mean, you all listen to different types of music and probably you use it for, you know, you know what kind of music you want to use when you want to be productive, other times when you're feeling down and you want to cheer up. So anyways, combining all that. Well, well, well actually, before the anyways, before the combining, uh, so, well, actually, maybe, do you want to talk about the combining bit and how oh, we're yeah. doing it? Okay. There's the next slide. So, as Zara said, what we've been doing at MINE is we've uh, been collecting data sets uh, from different people in different situations, different environmental situations, so time of day, location, light levels, etc. Recording the heart rate, actually, especially the heart rate variability. Uh, we've been looking at sleep, co-recording sleep. The brain activity and the brain activity, you know, as we just looked at, can tell you a lot. And that's kind of where we're headed in the longer term. But right now, the, the thing is that everyone has, well, almost everyone, just about everyone can speak, right? We all have a voice. And there's tons of information in voice, but you need to unlock that. Right now, the, the, the current systems are just looking at voice and predicting different aspects of mental states like stress, uh, emotions, attention, tiredness, creativity, these things. It's not great right now. And so what we're doing is we're combining, as Zara said, the voice. Uh, so how you say things, what you say with these other signals. And an event, so, so the first step for us, you might have seen, by the way, diagrams like this, like uh, when you're speaking, you get these like fluctuations. Uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but you know, you process those signals in, in all sorts of ways. You get things called a spectrogram, various kinds of spectrograms. And those are then fed into AI models, machine learning models. And you get what are called features, which are basically parts of the signal after you've processed them in certain ways, you then feed those to the models. And the models then learn uh, certain patterns, right? Certain patterns that correlate to stress, that correlate uh, in how, you know, how patterns of how you speak, how you say things, that correlate to, let's say, uh, good mood, anger, uh, that sort of thing. So that's kind of uh, without going into too much of the technical details. And that's, again, just another diagram showing uh, the concept. You know, we're taking wearables, we're taking BCI EEG signals, we're taking voice signals, and we're taking some contextual signals and putting that into uh, that type of model, uh, various kinds of machine learning AI models that we call bio-XLP, biologically explainable language processing. So in the kind of short term, over the next year to three years, we're really focusing, uh, and especially, you know, then the next few months we'll have the first versions ready in Q3, so that's... And that's the wrong year, Martin. Well, well no, it's, oh. oh, that's the wrong year, yeah. <laughs> Oops, yeah, it's not 2021, my bad. It, that's, that should say 2020. So in the next few months, we'll have the first version of uh, predicting all of these things just from voice. Right now we're using the biometrics, the wearables, in a few months, in a couple of months, we'll um, get to the point where we'll be able to do a lot of that very accurately just from voice. And that's kind of the, the stage where we're at now. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's all very complicated. This is very high level. Uh, I hope you appreciate that. Can you just go back one oh, yeah. second? So the, here on the right, if you see, so basically what right now we're working with is this personalized mental state. Um, and the things that we're looking at, I think we mentioned that again, stress levels, emotional state, attention, energy levels. And we're playing um, as well, starting to play with creativity. Um, but these are the four things that we can currently uh, yeah, building models. So the models are the different AI models that, that we've labeled here, the BioXLP AI stack of models. Different ones predict different aspects of mental states from voice and currently from voice and biometrics. But we're moving to voice only. And then that's kind of the bridge. Uh, what I want you to appreciate is that the whole voice thing is a bridge until the brain computer interfaces become good enough, right? Until the devices become cheap enough, accessible enough, powerful enough, the voice is like a great, um, great source of kind of information that we can deal with for um, understanding 
you know, the human right now, right? The body, the physiology, the mind. It's also non-invasive and, you know, physiologically speaking. So it's not like you need to wear anything or have any implants. It's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's accessible. So, ubiquitous. so we've put that, um, we'll, pro we'll probably uh, have time to show you a quick demo uh, la later uh, of the assistant as it is right now. We're actually in a, in a testing phase right now. So it's early days. Uh, we're testing with some consumers, with companies. Actually, if you're interested, uh, maybe Cesar can give you our contact details later. If you have an Android phone, uh, you can maybe join in the testing um, to see kind of how some of this works, this state-of-the-art technology. Uh, but right now, it's in the form of, a, of, an, of an app. Right now, it just runs on Android. We'll have an iOS version in the near future, in a few months. Um, and it does all these different things, right? So it gives you insights into your stress and emotions. Uh, actually, we're focusing on those two for the test right now, but we then have attention and energy levels, so tiredness and, and attention. Um, and then it can also forecast into the future. So that's one thing we haven't spoken about is, is you don't just, you're not, we're not just able to, uh, today with today's technology, we're not just able to look at your stress level now, your emotions right now. We can actually, we're doing some predictions now into the near future. So we can say, if you continue right now, your body signals suggest that you're going to be much less stressed or much more stressed in 30 minutes. So now you can do some preventative action, right? Maybe you're about to burn out or, or just get like uh, very upset or something. So that's called forecasting, right? Predicting into the future. Uh, and we're giving some explanations into the potential reasons for why your stress is increasing, for example, or your emotional state is, um, let's say, getting worse or more um, troublesome, let's say, more. Into, yeah. So we can give some insights into that, into what's uh, likely driving uh, the changes. Uh, let's skip over that for now. Um, so, well, actually, that, actually, that's it. Um, so the app right now, uh, you know, gives you kind of this, these insights in real time. Uh, also historically, you can see what's affected you historically in real time. You can get these insights, uh, and then it plugs into different products and services that you already use. So if you do any of you meditate, for example, uh, kind of no, any meditators? No, no. A little bit. Sorry, was that? And just uh, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So wouldn't it be great if when you meditate, you see how effective any given meditation session really is for you and which type of meditation actually works for you and which doesn't work so well for you, right? So like right now, it's quite passive, right? You just sit down. Maybe you're using an app. Do you use an app for that? Um, no, just um, uh, I haven't used apps yet. Um, just on YouTube, the playlist. Okay. Okay. So YouTube. Yeah. So many people have, there's like Headspace and Calm are the two famous ones. Uh, you can just use a, you know, a playlist on YouTube or something and that's fine. Like, um, but it's a very passive thing, right? I mean, you, you go there, you meditate and hopefully you feel better, but you don't know if it really worked for you physiologically, how much did it decrease your stress? Did it really improve your mood other than your kind of your own perception of it? Right. So you can now measure this with something like our, our app, our assistant, right? You can actually measure this in real time. Um, so basically, yeah, for now, initially, we, we're working with, on the one hand, with like people that already track themselves. So they call themselves biohackers. Um, so they track different aspects of their life. So we're working with that community and also like well-being, like wellness, where they really want to understand how to better design their practices to actually help people. Because right now they don't really have a way to measure and to know, you know, what, what helps, what doesn't and how. So that's kind of the initial stage. Um, and it's an app, as Martin said, that's connected to different wearables. If you are wearing any, that helps you make better sense of that in terms of your mental state. Um, and then we're starting to develop this voice interface. So it's to kind of going more in the direction of the C seamless AI assistant where, you know, you can actually talk oh. to it and ask it questions. Or sometimes if it notices like something really changes, it can kind of just notify you and let you know. Um, and so, or, or somewhere where you can just yeah, ask questions, interact. So that's... So, so the point there is that you don't have to look at... So right now it's on the phone. Uh, you have to look at your phone. It's running all the time. You don't actually even have to open the app. We have this notification that's constantly running that gives you a set, uh, like an overview of your mental state. If you go into the app, you get the more details and so on, and more uh, more things to do. 
Uh, but in the, over the next few months, they're building this voice interface, as she said. So you can kind of, uh, even if you just have earphones in, you can get uh, kind of a continuous reminders, uh, or you can talk to them and say, hey, um, how's my stress level the last few hours? Or during the last hour during this meet, uh, did you notice anything weird about my mental state, right? And it'll kind of give you, it'll tell you that over the, the earphones or something. The more, for me personally, I think the very interesting things as well are happening when you look back at the history. And I think this is something that we often, where the flow is where you don't really know in the long term, like you don't, we don't spot patterns very well, but if you, you can realize that maybe every Tuesday, you know, you tend to, have a certain like be really down or have certain stress levels and, it, and it's a pattern and then you can kind of look and it actually happened where you know there was something specific happening uh, you know at a company where you know it kind of just affected people's mood and then you know you can make changes like that but also looking over a year um, or, or even longer periods there's quite interesting patterns come up that we just consciously not aware of and those can be linked to stress to people in your life or to you know to your diet to your um, so there's a different ways you can look at behaviors that way. So I, so I think the, the point we're both trying to make um, is th this is what we're building. Obviously, you're encouraged to imagine things a little bit further in the future, uh, extensions of the current technology of an AI system like this, but even more advanced. Uh, you can imagine you know, voice interfaces. You can imagine body interfaces, physiological readings from the body, from the brain. Uh, in some cases, for some of you, and further in the future, they could even be implanted uh, things in your brain. Um, and, you, you know, it, the, this is going to, this is increasingly becoming something, you know, and we're building it like that, that's going to be there all the time to support you, hopefully support you. I mean, some of you have been looking at a little bit more of the darker side of things, but hopefully support you uh, continuously throughout the day, throughout different activities as you do them, right? And... This will be important on Mars. It will also be important on Earth. You know, we're building it for Earth for now. So that's that. Like, should we actually go on? Because yeah. uh, I think we've talked for a while. Um, so I want to show you this guy. Some of you might have seen this, this fella right here. Um, this is a great interview with this guy, Elon Musk. Uh, uh, it's with a guy called Joe Rogan. So he has a very interesting podcast. Do any of you watch Joe Rogan? Anyone? Matthew, Matthew watches Joe Rogan. Cool, cool. Anyone else? No, no. Oh, there's our, our. <laughs> cool. So uh, this is a um, this is a nice one, um, and I'm just gonna play like one or two minutes where he talks about Neuralink. So they are building uh, this intracranial interface, um, and we actually considered when we started the company should we focus on building hardware, and we've decided not for the for the near future, there's so much work to be done in building um, a hardware interface to the brain. Uh, and so let's let other people build the hardware. We'll focus on building the AI and the software in infrastructure. And so that as devices become available, we, we have this kind of framework to plug them into as they become available, right? Which a it's sort of an operating system, I guess, like if you think about it, how you have for like hardware. Um... Yeah. So let's just play uh, and listen that to this guy talk for one minute. It's likely that we minute, will merge minutes. somehow or another with this sort of technology and it'll augment what we are now, or do you think it will replace us? Well, that's the scenario. The, 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 the merge scenario with AI is the one that seems like probably the best. Like for if, us, yes. Like if you if you can't Beat it, join it. <laughs> That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so, from a long term existential standpoint, that's like the purpose of Neuralink is to create a high bandwidth interface to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. Because we have a bandwidth problem, you just can't communicate through your is too slow. And where's Neuralink at right now? I think we'll have something interesting to announce in a few months. That's at least an order of magnitude better than anything else. Probably, I think better than probably anyone thinks is possible. How much can you talk about that right now? I don't want to jump the gun on that. Um, but what's like the ultimate, what's, what's the idea behind it? Like what are you trying to accomplish with it? Like what would you like, best case scenario? 
I think best case scenario, we effectively merge with AI, uh, where we AI serves as a tertiary cognition layer, uh, where we've got the limbic system, um, kind of the you know, primitive brain essentially, we've got the cortex. So you're, you're currently in a symbiotic relationship. With your cortex and limbic system are in a symbiotic relationship, and generally people like their cortex and they like the limbic system. I haven't met anyone who wants to delete their limbic system or delete their cortex. Everybody seems to like both. And the cortex is mostly in service to the limbic system. People may think that 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 their that the thinking part of themselves is in charge, but it's mostly their limbic system that's in charge. And the cortex is trying to make the limbic system happy. That's what most of that computing power is oriented towards. How can I make the limbic system happy? That's what I was trying to do. Now, if, if we do have a third layer, which is the AI extension of yourself, that is also symbiotic. Um, and there's enough bandwidth between the cortex and the AI extension of yourself such that the AI doesn't de, de facto separate, then that could be a good outcome. That could be quite a positive outcome for the future. So instead of replacing us, it will radically change our capabilities. Yes, it will, it will enable anyone who wants to have superhuman cognition. Okay, so that's, uh, wait a sec, before we go to the final slide. So, so two things I want to highlight from that clip we just watched. One is um, what they're building is this, the, um, is this hardware, right? This implantable hardware. And you can actually watch a video of Neuralink and what that looks like. They basically drill a hole in your skull right now. Uh, and they developed a new way of drilling a hole basically in the skull that's a very, very small, it's four millimeters, uh, right? And then they go through that hole and insert these small chips that can then read and write signals to your brain. That's what they're experimenting with. And what we're building is more on the software and AI side, right? So as these things become available, uh, like I said earlier, we're building this kind of framework or operating system for plugging in different. And there's a few other companies, but it's not just Elon Musk and Neuralink. Facebook is working. They bought a, a company called Control Labs. You can check out their device. It's pretty cool. Uh, I've used it. Uh, there's Kernel. They're a little bit more secretive, but they're also building some kind of a neural interface. Um, so that, that's really cool. And what was the second point I want to make? Um, so two things, safety, no. So operating system, uh, you know what? Don't know, it's gone, doesn't matter, don't worry about it. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, so Elon said uh, this will boost our cognition. And the, the important thing to understand is it doesn't have to be just your thinking. It doesn't have to just be like how quickly you think or how much you, uh, you know, like memory, right? It's not like just in the matrix where you upload uh, information and like how to, how to, I don't know, like Kung Fu or something, right? It's not just that. You can, you can start to tweak people's morals, people's emotions. You can make people happier, more empathetic. Obviously, it can go in another direction too. But the point is, uh, bless you. Uh, bless you. Uh, the, the point is, you know, it doesn't just have to be cognition as such. It can be morals, empathy, emotions, uh, these sorts of things, right? Creativity, right? Um, all these things that we can um, kind of tap into and start to improve, right? Uh, so that's, that's what we're working on, this uh, build, we're building the software AI side. We're not working the hardware, but we are integrating with these different hardware devices. And that's where we're at today. And as these devices become more and more sophisticated, you know, we'll be there uh, we'll, with a ready kind of AI assistant that will be able to make use of it, you know, in the best way possible. Just wanted to throw something that's uh. very important is right now. So because you have these companies developing things, then I think that was to one of the points that we touched on earlier in terms of this control, right? So right now, probably most of, of us are being analyzed and people like company, different companies have different data and understand us and our behaviors 
that that we don't even necessarily think about or understand so what we wanted to do is to actually give a tool to the individuals right so that you are able to understand those things about yourselves that are in a way already being analyzed so for example if you're doing job you, you guys will be doing job interviews at some point a lot of companies are doing now using ai for interview process so when you're doing a video interview there's this uh, search they call this this company well there's many of them but basically the point is they're saying ai can really pick up on things they can pick on things that would analyze what kind of team player you will be you know so it's not just your kind of cognitive capacity communication mm -hmm. skills but it's actually different personality traits of you and they and the system will suggest the likelihood or the score they will assign to you how suitable you will be for that particular role or for their company's culture organization and you won't even know that so so yeah so, so just of, to be clear this is being used today like when you go for a company interview some companies are already using this their ai systems looking at your facial expressions at your language and starting to classify whether you're likely to like play well with others whether you're likely to like uh, leave the company soon that sort of thing right uh, that's that's maybe not the thing we want to focus on necessarily. Though, right? No, but just kind of, I uh, just wanted to highlight the point going back to us, so kind of it, the personal assistant for individuals, right? So who has access to that kind of technology is important. Yeah, um, we are trying to put this in the hands of individuals like yourselves. And as soon as uh, the AI assistant is sufficiently ready, we're going to spread it. And by the end of next year, we're hoping to have millions of people use it. And by the time we're on Mars, you know, we'll be there. We'll be there. So I want to end with one, one last thing for you guys uh, that I think is a pretty cool. Uh, there's a guy called Jason Silva, and he makes these um, pretty fun little... Cesar, do you know him? Or do you know of him? Uh, yes, I, I know him and uh, my wife is another. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll yeah. play this clip that, that's called We're Already Cyborgs. And the point is, we really are, like uh, with all these phones and gadgets and so on. <laughs> You know, there's this idea floating around, which I totally buy. It's this notion that we are already cyborgs. You know, people are so dystopian when they think about the future of technology. What they fail to realize is that we have been in a feedback loop, in a self-amplifying feedback loop with our technology since the origin of language and stone tools, for Christ's sakes. We use our technologies to extend the boundaries of what we are. Our tools are our exoskeletons. They are scaffoldings, extending our thought, reach, and vision, as Andy Clark says. There's a book by Andy Clark called natural born cyborgs and him and David Chalmers they coined the extended mind thesis which is this idea that we're literally extending the boundaries of the human mind with these technologies our smartphones are extensions of our cognition they are examples of distributed intelligence iPhone therefore I am I mean literally and this idea that that our second skin is our technology it's our turtle shell it's our exoskeleton is is it sort of blurs the boundary of sort of saying that there's nature and then there's technology and and in fact, it's all on a continuum. We just smack in the middle between the born and the made, as Kevin Kelly says. But even Nietzsche used to say, man is a bridge and not an end. We are a means towards self-extension. Our technology has become part of our skin. We must get over our skin bag bias. The biological skin bag is just one membrane. Our cells have membranes too, but our body is still a part of us and our tools are a part of us. We transcend membranes. We extend ourselves. That's what we do. We are already cyborgs. Cool. So um, that, that's uh, I, I really like that one. Have you guys? Has anyone seen it before? Cool, cool. Cesar, that's good. <laughs> is anyone else? I'm, I'm your good student. <laughs> indeed, indeed, quite. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to. Uh, actually, I'll keep sharing my screen in case you have questions. I'll go back to some slides. Let's uh, let's maybe go a little bit more in. What's that? It's been an hour. It's been an hour, yeah, yeah. But uh, if you have any questions or go in a bit more detail on specific things that we talked about, let's see if I can. Uh, I had a question about using the AI for uh, job interviews. So sure. um, as the world of work changes uh, during the 2020s, especially considering coronavirus, so how do you think this will impact um, the job market, especially uh, in comparison with uh, really reputable and credible degrees from prestigious universities compared to 
um, the reliability in, of AI because it might be harder for traditional companies to implement. Uh, what might be harder for traditional companies to implement the AI, the AI approach? But they might be a little uh, apprehensive about um, using the, like that to determine employ employability, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's I think what's happening is um, it's quite interesting uh, that these AI approaches and systems are tend to be very cheap once they're built. So, developing them is quite expensive. It takes a while. It's a lot of trial and error. A lot of thinking goes into it. And once you've built the software it's very cheap to spread it and use it and copy it. I mean, generally that's the case with software, right? So I think what's, what seems to be happening, what I think is gonna happen is there is a few companies using these approaches now, but actually over time, more and more companies will use these AI approaches because they're so cheap and they do actually work fairly well. There are issues, of course, with the approach, but then there's issues with degrees, right? If you get a degree from a really good school, it doesn't mean that you're a good fit for the company. You might be, it also doesn't mean that you're necessarily, um, you know, as smart as someone with not such a good degree or even without a degree, right? Uh, so these things are not perfect, of course. You know, the, the AI, AI approach is not perfect. The degree approach is not perfect. And, you, you know, for a while, you'll probably see a mix of the two. Uh, in all honesty, I think degrees will disappear in, uh, in say, a, I don't know, a few decades. Uh, I think it's, it's not impossible that they'll disappear or become less important. Maybe I can, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. No, I was just going to say that I think often they, they work together. It's not like they completely outsource it to AI and, you know, they're still right. human in the loop. Uh, and I can see that's still continuing for a while. But I think just the fact that there is a system that can be more knowledgeable and picking on certain things that humans don't, um, just to kind of, it's, it's an assistant of sorts yeah. that I yeah. think a lot of companies will increasingly use alongside the just the pure human interview process. So maybe I'll, I can chip it in because this is happening to us already. So uh, as we'd say in December, we send, we were looking for a finance, a finance, um, like a finance person for our company, an admin and finance person for our company. We put the ads on multiple platforms, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and um, uh, the local uh, jobs DB, which is a local like biggest uh, market, much bigger than LinkedIn actually for Hong Kong specifically. And we had 10 applications, same job description. We put the same ad um, last week. Uh, in three days, we had 60 applicants. So we don't have the bandwidth to actually um, uh, in interview the 60 applicants. It would just take us too much time. So if we had an AI uh, that could help us, so they, they are the, the system, the website already kind of make a recommendation or, or kind of ranks people to a certain degree or you can easily compare them. You can filter them by level of, for example, years of, um, you can you can apply multiple filters, not AI, but we have to change the way uh, we're going to interview them. So instead of giving them like 30 minutes, like what we would have normally, then we're going to have to do several layers of interviews and um, and we're going to use similar to what you're doing in at mind we're going to be basically we find that to have a good finance person actually it really a lot depend on the ability to communicate with the financial status the willingness to communicate with us if we're in difficulty uh, we find that was the most important or uh, giving us advice when they see an opportunity for the company and so those things we want to test those kind of capability in a verbal interview because this kind of ability of communication is not something you can see by by cv but it's definitely something you can perceive when you do when you do like a verbal interview um so yeah so we if if website had the ability to give us an ai kind of filtering that would be higher performance would they would help us to uh, kind of sequence the order in which we interview people but we do have to like what you said we have to couple both ai and uh you know, to to make the final decision like a human element yeah for sure yeah agreed at least yeah. for now at least for now until uh, the right. ai gets good enough or becomes right. us as a part of us in the, even in companies like uh, Google, where I have several friends who we interviewed and now work there, they've told me the grueling process of going, going through multiple layers of interviews. And I think uh, I had some friends who went through like seven ro rounds of interviews. Or oh, they went to like not seven interviews, but seven say, challenges. And some of them are quiz and it's about the cognition, like measuring the ability to collaborate, uh, how to relate to authority, um, you know, the ability to focus in it. Uh, and I would say for companies like that, then AI would be really really huge the bigger the company and the more uh, um, i'd say the more there's at stake and the more likely they're going to be using ai because they can't make a mistake when they hire somebody yeah, to, to yeah. answer uh, the cost of hiring is very very high yeah. Um, yes. yeah so you can't afford to lose people once you've gone through it so so just to give uh, one concrete number to that um 
uh, like in the UK, the, the average uh, cost of hiring a new employee in, in the big companies and like consultancies, I briefly work in one of the consultancies, is about 30 to 40,000 pounds. So if someone leaves the company and then going through that whole process of finding someone, bring them into the company, 30 to 40,000 pounds, right? Uh, call it $50,000. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So anything that can save the company's money uh, and make that process a little bit quicker, a little bit more efficient is going to get used, right? Yeah. I see, um, I see a company in India, as recently the founder of Zoho. Um, yeah. Big companies that start to actually create schools where they train uh, people who don't have like, they, they just demonstrate their personality traits and then they will basically train them for very, very specific tasks. Um, and I think for very large company, that might be a trend, I think, coming. Uh, we, see, we see the materialization of schools and more and more private schools and micro yeah. certificates, online universities. Sure, so I think sure. that's, that's going to be the direction. A friend of mine is a company where he works with corporates creating education content. So say he works with banks and, stuff, and they, he helps them to create specifically education content that they want people kind of to go through that, that are going to work there or they want to work there. So it's broad enough, but it was specific focus. So that minimizes, you know, the risks in a sense, because they kind of, they will prioritize people taking from, from that pool of applicants. Uh, any 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 other questions? Should we maybe take like a uh, few more questions on the if you want on the topic? Uh, yeah, actually, I have a question about uh, the EEG that you mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah. I was Which just wondering. One, um, if, yeah, yeah. Like one of these or? Um, yeah. I think the sort of the other one, so one that comes after the more these. Yeah, so, so it, it's not like a specific one. It's more a, a general question about EEG. So sure. I just want to, sure, yeah. I was just wondering like how, uh, because as you said, like even the cheaper ones, like uh, like a like three hundred, four hundred dollars, and yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, is there? Do you think there's going to be like a like an entry level sort of thing for our people to, I, I know like, a, like an R&D sort of thing for people to try and hack uh, their own way, like an Arduino for EEG coming. Um, oh, that, that exists, I, yeah, that exists already, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so there, is something um, called the, there is something called the Open BCI, for example. I mean, there's a couple of different headsets like that. Uh, I. If you like uh, like hacking things and building prototyping things, check out OpenBCI. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. It's actually running um, one of the Arduino chips. It's basically an Arduino uh, platform um, with some additional chips for signal processing and so on, right? Uh, so you can use this, uh, and you can th you can either get their design and three D print your own helmet uh, like this, uh, and they have a, I think their best one is sixteen channels, so sixteen electrodes to record from. Um, and the basic version, I think, does eight, eight electrodes, uh, or maybe it was, yeah, I think it's eight, the basic version. Uh, so that's quite a hackable one. But then even with some of the other ones, uh, people have taken them apart and then connect, connected and reconnected them with different devices. Is that, is that what you're talking about? or? Um, yeah, so I, mean, I was just wondering, because it feels like a lot of the research that people are doing right now, it's very company-based, like it's very, like, Big, like Neuralink or other big companies and I was just wondering if there's like a market or something out there that's like normal people are doing uh, in terms of like PCI um, yeah yeah so yeah. so if you if you look at these these are kind of uh, BCI headsets for quote-unquote normal people right so you can go and order one of these headsets and it's it's quite useful it's pretty easy to use and this one is like 250 bucks these are like you know 400 ish um, and you can buy them and then use them for like develop. They have an SDK, they have APIs and SDKs, right? So you can buy one of these or this one and you can develop your own applications and start, you know, building your own thing that's driven by brain signals, right? So like, this is not, I mean, they're not like super small companies, but, uh, these things are not like for very special use cases only, right? Like you can buy it and build your own thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? 
Uh, I have a question. Um, so if your system is going to be driven mostly by voice in the first phase, voice is typically not something you use by yourself, it's something you use between people. And so um, uh, would you detect the person you're talking to and therefore more the kind of relationship you have with the other person or, or the kind of like uh, shared intelligence, like kind of conversation you have with the other person? Because the way you, yeah, because it's going to be highly dependent on who you're talking to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we are right now, it doesn't distinguish uh, very well between people, but we are working on that for basically picking up who are you, which are you, which person are you in a group of people and who else are you talking to? We are working towards that. It doesn't do it right now. Right now, we're just looking at kind of the, the pattern of speech uh, from you and around you, right? It, it, yeah, but for sure, that's super but yeah, important. It will yeah. do that. And then we're also thinking of this kind of sharing features, right? So on the one hand, it's like privacy, it's your tool. Um, but then, you know, you have family members or team or colleagues. So, you know, so to have the option where, you know, whether it's like in your classroom, for example, you're going to get the thing, or, you know, if you're gaming with someone or with your partner at home, so you have that shared space where, you know, you can kind of either know each other or see how, you know, how that as a whole works together. You, so, you know how you can share your location with people? Yeah. Like on WhatsApp or Facebook. Think like that, but with mental states, right? I see. Mm. It's, uh, like well, you can share your mental state, like your stress level, or your emotional state, your attention with your family members, your work colleagues. Because, for example, like um, um, for example, I think the example of my wife. Let's say when she speaks to me, uh, she would speak in a certain tone of voice, and then when she speaks to her sisters, you know, because they have all this like history, then her voice would completely change. And when right, she speaks right. to her mother or to a coworker, it's like a different person almost. And so. Um, sure. She could be in the same emotional states, but the way she communicates is completely different. So that's really interesting. And, and I, I, know, I know it's true. Like, obviously, we, we all have that to, to various degrees. But actually, a lot of the things that uh, the models pick up, they're the kind of basic features of speech that don't seem to change overly, right? So they're, for example, um, when, uh, what's, I don't know, what's a good example? Um, excitement tends to correlate with higher pitch, right? And it, is, it has a particular, uh, like particular pattern in the, in the different types of spectrograms of how the pitch increases. And that might change between situations, but you'll see that general pattern as excitement goes up, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Is there more, one more question for the students? So are we taking a, a break? Yeah. Anything else? Uh, BCIs, wearables, AI? Hiring. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no question, I had, an, I had another question. Um, so Elon Musk was saying that uh, we have the limbic brain and that's more yeah. like about, about survival and trying to like fulfill our primary needs. Like I'm hungry and, and then he said that the cortex, which is I'm understanding like more like the thinking and higher abstraction. And then we have the AI, which is uh, more connected to like facts, actually connected to the things of the world out there. Uh, if it's not like fed with misinformation, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and so, and then I looked at recently an article saying that the reason why uh, Angela Merkel uh, in Germany is uh, managing better the um, say climate crisis or the COVID-19 uh, crisis because she's analytical, because she's a scientist and right. she would lead her country in a more uh, fact base of uh, uh, like uh, policy making. And so if I, Use this kind of logic it means that it means that if we want to have a better world this would suggest that you need to have a more ai or more fact-based world and basically ignoring short-term uh, reward and prioritizing long-term uh, long, uh, like delayed uh, gratification so does it mean that um, it's implicit through the adoption of this technology that we should be uh, agreeing uh, on a moral basis that we should uh, delegate a decision making to ai increasingly because it just makes better decision yeah, so uh, Cesar, don't get me started. I think this is a long and very interesting conversation. I'm very, uh, I, I love this, I love this topic. So I, I think, you know, the one of the biggest dangers and one of the, um, the, the worst things about our species, right, is the short term thinking, right? So, so many problems arise from that. So I personally agree that, that we should move much more towards learning how to think longer term with consequences. I mean, you look at the environmental effects, you look at the moral effects of like industrial farming. Uh, all sorts of things, right, are, uh, are very much driven by short-term thinking that, that would, and, and if we thought longer-term, larger scale, you know, all of humans over a longer term, 
things would be better. I, I think that's not necessarily the same thing as saying that the technology should be used a certain way. Like we are designing a technology. We have some say over how it will be designed and what it will be used for maybe. No, nope. like it's not, a, I don't think it's necessarily uh, predetermined that it will be used for making us, like it could also end up being applied towards a kind of brave new world type of world, right? Where uh, everyone's living uh, for the next gratification, right? The next most effective gratification. Like it could end up being steered in that direction. Hopefully not, hopefully not. Um, I definitely think that algorithms and AI, if applied right, uh, which they aren't right now, could lead us towards being more uh, kind of uh, thinking larger scale, longer term. Um, that's not how they're being used right now. Right now they're being used for, let's get people to scroll more. Let's get people to buy more right away. So actually, if, maybe, if anything, they've been used in exactly like the opposite way than, than perhaps we'd hope. Right. Um, uh, by the way, you mentioned the limbic system. I just wanted to say a couple of quick words for everyone else. Okay. Um, the, so the limbic system is basically the part of the brain that's kind of a little bit more inside. Uh, so when you think of the brain, the thing you see is not the limbic system. That's kind of the cortex, the outside part. And it's actually the most of your brain is, is the cortex <laughs> not, uh, nowadays. Um, but the limbic system is sort of the kind of the older, evolutionarily older brain. And that deals much more with emotions. A lot of it is with memory and emotions. A lot of that is here, a lot of that stuff, uh, basically. But then that talks to the, to the covering, the cortex, which does a lot of the thinking that, like a lot of the speaking, the thinking, a lot of the memories are also in the cortex, right? So that's a bit more evolutionarily newer, uh, a bit more advanced in terms of the kind of things it can do. Uh, but they talk to each other all the time. And as, as Elon said, you know, a lot of your, a lot of your compute cycles in the brain are really spent towards uh, uh, trying to make, you know, the limbic system happy. There's a lot of truth to that, you know. Cool. Any, anything else? Anyone else? Um, I don't know how long you guys are going to be after the session. I just have one specific question. I think that to help them to choose um, features on their products, or on their technology or the scenarios. Um, yeah. So when you are on a, on a technology that has such an open runaway and there's so many experiments happening simultaneously, how do you avoid what they call in app development feature creep? Because we always want to add more functions to it because there's so many inputs and output that can be had. Um, when you define a product, how do, you, how do you decide like, this is the set of features that I want my product to have and this is what it's going to be. Of course you could do more, but how do you decide like we're gonna make a release with those features? How do you decide that? Uh, well, that, that's, that's like a super complex and great question, super complex. Uh, um, in, in like there's a couple of different answers to it, right? Um, like you can't, as you say, you can't just say, hey, let's add this. Let's also build this integration. Let's add this additional feature because then you get, I don't know if the students saw that feature creep basically means that more and more features are creeping in, coming into a product. And at some point you get this feature bloat too many things in a product. It does tries to do too many things and does none of them very well. So usually with this sort of thing, you need to think very clearly, okay, what is it that you're trying to achieve, right? What is the product meant to do? And then you need to think, what are the kind of feature, well, it, 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 there's different steps here, but what are the potential features that could solve that problem or that thing that you're trying to do? And then there's uh, different type, different ways of testing that, uh, uh, different approaches to testing that, right? Uh, so one approach is that you don't actually build the product or the features as such, but you prototype them, which is kind of what you're encouraged to do, I think here, which is great. You prototype them in different ways. You go and test them and you do multiple iterations of this and gradually, um, you know, kind of like what you're doing, gradually you're, you typically end up building a more and more accurate, a more and more powerful version of a feature. And eventually if you get enough positive feedback, you decide, you know what, we're going to implement this. We're going to build the full feature in the real product. And then you build it in. Um, one comment on that from the real world is, as you build a, like a product for the real world is uh, often like it's hard to know which signals to believe, right? Which signals are actually uh, accurate signals of interest. Uh, and so the real ways, the, 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 in, in many cases, the best signal for interest in a product or feature is to actually put it out there and get users to use it. And at that point, like you see, like people, are people paying for it? Are, are they actually using it? Because if they're not, it's, uh, you know, like you're, you're kind of imagining that they're finding it useful, you know, like, so 
at some point, so there, there's different approaches. You can test, you can prototype, and that's great. I love it, and, and you're encouraged to do that, right? Uh, and another approach is build the first working version as soon as you can, which is somewhat similar to prototyping, but we'll build a first working version as, in some sense representative of the feature, right? Like a basic version of that feature, put it out there, get people using it and get kind of a real world feedback, right? That real world signal about whether it's useful, whether people are, yeah. Yeah, and I think as well as important is to come because we, we've gone through that where somebody would say, oh, it'd be nice to have this and it'd be nice to have this. And before you know it, we started building product up with a product that had nothing to do, like it used the technology, but it's nothing to do with what we originally started with. But more importantly, nothing that we even really passionate or interested about. So instead of doing a consumer product, we ended up building a platform for employee, for employer to you know, I mean, we didn't go through it, but it's just incredible how, like, who you talk to, what, you know, how, how you act. If you don't filter that at every stage of the way, uh, you can just get steered in a direction that's, you know, sometimes it's, it's for, for the good, but sometimes it can just totally derail you. So I think like a core certain set of core principles like of okay what is it you want to achieve what is really your thesis um yeah and then i think a lot of the features are kind of supporting features for for that main thing that you're trying to do but sometimes surprisingly you'll find that like the feature that was a little add-on actually turns out to be more useful in its interaction thank you thank you so much um, um, I think we're going to be taking a small break. Are you guys going to come back after the break or, or we, we let you go? Um, yeah, I can do, uh, we do, uh, the guys who are going to present the work. Um, because, it's only the work? Half, because it's only half an hour, I'm thinking maybe I'll go through some of the material that I prepared. And what we can do is the, um, um, you, Mart Martin and Sarah, maybe we can just read the story and then give them feedback on the stories uh, in the next two days. So like this, we, because I think if they present, it might be too short for each of them. So instead of that, maybe um, I present the materials that I have to present to them and answer their questions. Um, um, if, if you guys are not coming, going to come back afterwards, I just wanted to mention that uh, you, you kind of uh, touch, touch upon it during your, during your presentation. You mentioned um, some of the tools that the designers can use uh, to prototype, which are kind of low tech and, and simple. And I picked up uh, listening to you that you said that some of the like mood sensing can be done through webcam. Uh, uh, some of it can be done through through the phone. You mentioned that you can put your finger on the on the phone. Uh, galvanic skin response, and you mentioned some like DIY ways to do that. And of course, the voice, uh, voice analysis, and like a semantic analysis, like text, or even like more low tech. And um, if you're not coming back after the break, just to mention that that's what we're going to be doing next week. Uh, we're going to be introducing the students to uh, a couple of those tools. So this this week was more like a horizon, but next week there will be we'll, we'll show you more practical things that you can use. Yeah, yeah, we've got some interesting tools that. We're going to share next time. We'll, we'll see. Actually, we have a, quite a long list of like 20 or so. Maybe we won't even get oh, to cover wow. all of them. Yeah, we'll, we have we'll a lot of examples. Them, so yeah, you guys can exactly. them. Uh, but actually, uh, I think uh, uh, I'd like to say for a couple of yeah. the presentations just to see like how they think okay. about it more, right? Sure. Yeah. Then in this case, then let's take a three minutes uh, break, bio break. And then uh, three of them who are not the one from last week can present as well, uh, because I don't think we'll have the time to do all of them, just, just, to, just a couple. You can also choose. Uh, maybe you want to pick which one you want to hear about. Um, or was, if they are volunteers, they, they can just step up. Uh, yeah, we did like last time. It'll be hard to pick. <laughs> yeah. OK, so let's take a quick break. It's 6.01. Uh, let's meet. Yeah, let's meet at, uh, at uh, 6.05. So we have like four minutes break. Sounds good. Okay, talk to you guys. Great, Alex. See you in a bit. So whenever they, um, they come back, uh, we'll start again.
Hey guys. Somebody was trying to say something. Hey, hey. Oh, you're back. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, so do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So um, I made a screen cap. I hope that that's okay when you're, when you're making a presentation because some part of your screen really caught my attention. Um, so I'll start by making some comments about the presentation, asking some uh, further questions that kind of segue into, uh, into my, my sharing. Uh, so I see that you have this graph. What does this graph represent? Oh, yeah. So, so I wish I could tell you that it's some aspect of my mental state. And that's a great incidental idea that just came up. I'm going to write a plug in for I'm going to write a plug in from my operating system to link to heart rate variability in different mental states. But that is not that's just uh, that's like different. Um, that's like CPU and, and RAM usage and stuff network usage. So uh, so for you, it comes very, very naturally. And I, and I was I was predicting uh, accurately because you just said that I was predicting that you would so it, you might you would you anticipate that computers of the future would have like computer activity and brain activity and you expect them to be like coincidental they'd be like uh, superimposable or do you think they would be complementary it means that when you are say, say studying a intensive calculation your brain can go to rest and it's kind of like your computer brain <laughs> the computer mm -hmm. takes over how do you how do you imagine this relationship to be oh that's that's an interesting point um mm. In terms of the actual, in terms of the actual compute, yeah, maybe maybe it will be a little bit like that where you take turns to. Uh, so some biological brains actually have that feature. Some um, is it birds or is it some dolphins? I think dolphins and some aquatic animals, half of their brain is in a in a either completely or partially a sleep state, while the other half of the brain is working very actively, and they alternate like that. Uh, so maybe it'll be a little bit like that, like you say. I'm, wow. I'm, I don't know. Um, Though I see another, another possibility, which is the more active your brain, the more the AI would have to kind of really work to make sure that it's, it understands what the hell is going on. Because you <laughs> suddenly run into this like, uh, creative exploratory state or really, really trying to focus and it reads to make sure that you, you, know, you, know, you, you do it right, that, that, it work, that, you know, that it's actually helping it, supporting at the critical time. Right. So I maybe I so. like it. Yeah. I've seen some videos where you have, um, we have uh, in some Chinese school, they already use those uh, brain bands to monitor the students. Have you seen those? those um... I, I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they use them, I think, mostly for attention tracking, right? Exactly. And yeah. um, do, you, do you see this as a positive development or do you see this as something scary? And or how, how do you feel about this? Or do you think it's the new normal and that's just how it's going to be? Or So, so I, I think it's... Um... I think in the process of getting to a more positive future, you go through a few things where you, they may not immediately, you might not immediately identify or stop and identify them as danger, dangerous or potentially dangerous situations like the classroom monitoring of students, right? Going then to population monitoring and so on. Right. So I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a positive thing, but I think you have to go through a few of these to learn some lessons and to have the discussions, right? And to actually come to some kind of a, a better understanding of like what is it that we want to build what is it that we don't want to build right right so i i that particular thing uh, it, it's tricky like i think there's good use i think there's good use cases of it though yeah um so actually um i just wanted to mention that what you just described is uh, what is sort of described in this book which i highly recommend it's a book written by my former professor uh tony june and fiona Rebi. And, uh, I, just one... them. I, did, I didn't realize, but they're still there because they went to New York, no? They yeah. Now. yeah, just before moving to New York, they, they actually came to prospect in Hong Kong. I tried to convince them to, uh, to move to Hong Kong, but they, they thought that Hong Kong is very interesting and very exciting, and there's a lot of interesting potential, but they felt it was not mature enough for their kind of like level of thinking because they couldn't find like a, an intellectual climate where they would find people that could be the speak to there's just a few people that kind of think on their level uh in was in new york there's a lot of people who think on that kind of uh, level but um mm -hmm. so in this book which i highly recommend it's been recently uh, translated into chinese so you can also read it in chinese if you want um you can see that there's a cone of today uh, starting from today and it goes into a different possible future and then there's a possible future the probable future what is likely to happen if we just keep status quo and then there's a preferable future if we were very intentional and if we drive technology develop in a certain way is something that could happen and uh, i don't know if it's very legal but i found a pdf link where you could read the whole book online um but so because i know now with the with the, with the covid and also like difficulties of getting shipment uh, i think i think it's 
it would not be reasonable for me to not share it as well because he, you may not be able to 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 get it if you if it was if it was not to this manner or maybe you, you know don't have so much money so yeah so it's for educational purpose so highly recommend this book whoops uh, i clicked on it thanks, thanks Seth. I'll, I'll check it out as well yeah oh, i haven't read it looks it, sounds interesting it's super interesting it's basically uh just the opening statements i, I don't want to be a spoiler so i just give you the opening statement no, no further. but it's basically saying that um you know like uh kind of like breakthrough technology and uh you know, like cutting edge design is no longer uh, the edge. Uh, like speculative design is a way to, and it's very much what we're doing, is that we're projecting ourselves in the future and we're trying to uh, draw those different scenarios, the blue one, the possible, the probable, and the preferable. Um, I tend to like my students to work more in the preferable space and not to like just write, write about dystopia, uh, like what you would have seen in the, in the matrix, um, just because I think that's our role as, as designers to, to help you know, design a better society is, it is useful from the point of view of storytelling to say like negative stories, but uh, if you're gonna make it a job of yours, like, yeah, don't be, <laughs> don't, don't be evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's also this other book, which is much older, uh, 1968, which I highly recommend if you're starting to think about objects and stories. Um, system, the system des objets, of course, it's also in, uh, in, in, in English, the system of objects. Uh, but it's talking about like implication of like consumerism and how objects uh, make but also destroy society um, and change the way we think and how we relate to each other. So I highly, uh, highly recommend that if you, on the side of writing your own story, you want to have like a really deep reflection. Um, yeah. Um, yeah he, I, he has a few other very interesting books, by the way. Yes. You probably know. Yeah, yeah. But to please recommend them. Would you recommend them other ones? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, was, I shouldn't have said that. I can't remember the title right now. There, there no, is one, there, there's the one, the famous one about, um, you know, the, the, the copies of ideas and how they no longer, ah, uh, man, yeah, if you just write it, it'll come up. If um, I, if I switch, is a, yeah. Uh, simulacra and Simulation, that's the one, that's the one. Simulacra and Simulation. Oh, yes, Simulacra and Simulation. It's really good. That was a good simulacra one, yeah. Simulation. It's oh, been a while. maybe PDF as well, yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. The information wants to be free, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, here you go. It is. Information is free. Okay. Yeah. So I put the, the PDF as well here. Um, this is a very fun read. So I put it here as well, right there. Uh, simulacre et simulation. Okay. Uh, and it's not because he's French that I, that I mentioned. Sure. Jeff, <laughs> Um, I just want to mention this, uh, this article that I published yesterday that I think is super important as well in how you architecture your, your thoughts and the kind of design that you guys are going to are producing right now. Um, so this is an article that was published in Bloomberg, Bloomberg being, you know, like a primarily a, a news agency and a, and a financial uh, company at the beginning. But they, they do publish more and more opinion piece, which I think reflects on how they want to interact with the market instead of like uh, uh, I'd say uh, suffering the market they, they tend to want to be a driving force increasingly and they do that through media which is very interesting to me but anyway so they, they publish this article and they say okay guys we understand that covid and you can see a, a multiplication of surveillance software where people say uh, would you be willing to share your location and um, who you've been interacting in the last few days and then we're going to help the government basically to track uh, who is who is sick and how how it goes from person to person. And uh, I just uh, copy pasted from this article. Oh, I forgot to to put the link. I'm going to put it right after, where they describe different cultural approach. Right? Cultural approach is, is is really fundamental in how we design. Um, design is manifestation in in our cultural. Uh, um, tone, uh, overtones. So Americans will have a different approach, Chinese with different, German with different approach. So for example, like um, uh, in the video that you've shown, the DW, the first video that you showed uh, to us, Martin, uh, was a German produced video. And uh, generally I would say German and French have generally a negative, um, generally like uh, culturally, a, general, a negative uh, presumption of what technology can do um, for historical reasons. And so, it, so those, uh, the, histor the history create cultural habits. Um, so being in Hong Kong, I think it's generally techno optimistic. Um, so you just have to be self-aware of your cultural baggage. And it doesn't have to be something that's negative. You could use that at your at your at your advantage. Like Japanese, you know, I showed you like ghost in the shell, this kind of aesthetics. 
and, um, and the choices that we make about how technology is made is going to be reflective of your culture. So you just need to be aware of that uh, when you present it to other people, that you are, in a way, an ambassador of a certain way of, of, uh, of thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, so that was just uh, some uh, some comments um, on the on the presentation by Zara Martin. Um, we have several stories. Uh, uh, is there um, some people who are willing to uh, to share, to jump in, and and tell tell their stories? So that because we don't have the time for everybody, but I think we have the time for one or two stories, depending on how quickly you can uh, walk us through. Maybe not just the guys from last time, right? Uh, maybe no. someone new as well. Yeah. Exactly, someone new, preferably. Um, if you don't have the chance to speak now, uh, we will review, uh, I mean, I, at least I will review your, I don't know if Martin and Sarah have the time, but I will definitely review your, your text and illustration and, and give you feedback on the document. So at least you can also see each other's feedback. So the comment that I do on one person, uh, you know, may be useful for somebody else to so read through the comments of everybody. I will try to do that today or, or tomorrow. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave feedback as uh, well, yeah. Is everyone's so, right. work in the presentation now? I think so. I'm just wondering when to schedule if we're doing that so we kind of make sure that we cover everyone. Um, yeah, I think everybody has got their presentation in. I think we have 11 or 9 presentations. Right. That was the point, right? So I guess they should be. It's only this one. I'm not sure. I think it belongs to um, to Yui and uh, Winnie. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so, yeah. a, so who is willing to jump in and share? We did not present, um, we did not present last time. Curious why that, what's that guy doing? <laughs> uh, I guess this is about, this one is about sex uh, in space. Um, this one is, uh, well, because it's 2013, then it's uh, more bulky interfaces. So who is willing to share? Actually, I think my story and Fergo's story, the first part are the same. So, uh -huh. yeah, share the, oh, actually, we share the page 41, the slide as well. Sure. Okay. So, it's, it's yours. So maybe under five minutes, so we have time to give some feedback as well. Yeah, so, I think uh, based on today's presentation, our, our story are very similar to the my the, uh, technology. Um, yeah, the BCI uh, that you introduced to us today, uh, because our um, variable device, uh, not only the variable device, but also the, the sensors throughout the whole spacesuit can detect the body condition and their mental status of the uh, astronauts on the Mars. And also um, we build a system that uh, the data not only can reflect on the wearable device, but also transmit it to the Earth. So the scientists on the Earth and also AI can also monitor their status and give some instructions if necessary. Yeah. Yeah, kind of the adjustment of their mentality and uh, also the physical conditions to augment or adjusting their um, yeah, spirits. That's great. Do you, do you see that the device that you'll be design, then designing is the whole suit or is it like a combination of suit plus software or what do you think would be your focus for prototyping? Um, I think um, we um, the reason why we also incorporate the spacesuit and the wearable device uh, is that um, not only can stimulate your um, brain, but also it can give some uh, stimulation on your body, the reflection, um, yeah, uh, at the same time. Um, so it's like a development of uh, the wearable device or the BCI. Yeah. So one comment from me is uh, you say something here about real time, the, although it will undergo a 45 minute delay because of the you know, transmission between Mars and Earth. So 
already the current robots on Mars, the rovers, they're semi-autonomous. So they obviously send information to Earth, but they can make some decisions by themselves already there because, you know, in some cases you can't wait uh, for, you know, 40 minutes or, or whatever it is, you know, depending on the, the exact positioning of Earth and Mars. So especially with something like uh, changing brain signals, you say at the end, you said at the end of your thing, um, that it'll, it might stimulate dopamine release. So that, that's true. That's, that's like one approach to making people happier. But you actually, for that sort of thing, if you want to do it right, you need to measure in real time. And I bet, and I'm sure that the AI will be on Mars. Uh, where, but it's an interesting idea that maybe to monitor them and to have some input from Earth as well. So maybe we'll have some kind of like a checks and balance. So there might be AI you know, powered systems on Mars that are kind of completely real time, very plugged in immediate, you know, they're, they're there on Mars, the signals come in and almost immediately they respond uh, and adjust the person's well-being, emotional state, physical state. But maybe there is another system as a kind of control system that where the signals get sent to Earth and maybe they send like um, their, their own version of like what should happen, right? So is that what you had in mind or you just thought that the AI is too complex to have on Mars, like too much compute, too much energy. Like I'm, I'm wondering why you thought the signals would need to go to Earth. Um, because we want to retain the autonomy of the astronauts to control themselves um, uh, as the priority, but at the same time, they may face some um, situations that are beyond their ability to react to. That's, and also their uh, data, uh, because we are at, at the very early stage of exploring the Mars, so their data can be very precious resource for humans and scientists to uh, do research on. That's why we want to also share the data back to the Earth. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 just I so I agree with the uh, data sharing back to Earth. I guess I was wondering, it, it, you know, the, the signals, obviously the feedback would have to be in many cases real time, right? Yeah. So AI itself would respond in real time. It would be there on Mars, but you're saying a copy of the data and so on would also go back to Earth. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And you want input from other people on Earth. Was that part of it as well or? Yeah. So, um, if necessary, the, the Earth can also give some input to the astronauts on the Mars. Hmm. Um, I, have some, I have some quick questions just to uh, help to uh, kind of thicken or give more, more um, to the story. So my first question is, are there only two people or are there more people on Mars? Because if it's just two people, um, that's a certain type of story, like a kind of um, life of pie kind of story. <laughs> Have you seen the movie Life of Pi when it's like one guy stuck on a, on a boat with a tiger and it turns out actually the tiger the whole time was just a, a metaphor of what the other person actually was an actual person. Uh, so that's the first question. The second is, uh, do you feel that AI will be judging negatively their sexual impulse or to the opposite? They would say, hey, you're going to Mars and we need to build a whole colony. So I'm going to, um, to tweak your mind. So I'm going to make sure that you have more sex so that we could have more people on Mars or just to increase that chance of survival on Mars. Um, so what do you say to those two questions? Um, so based on the timeline, there will be at most five people but in the story, uh, so we sent four astronauts, yeah. And then I think the AI, um, because AI is more um, modifying people's minds. So um, we just want to be humane. Um, we, we don't want to do any anti-humane decisions of the program in the AI. Because in certain culture, let's say in Indian culture, I have some friend of Pakistani, um, are my age, uh, they have arranged marriage and they completely accept it. So it's not like a thing from the past, like in certain culture, arranged marriage is, is com still completely normal. And so uh, I imagine if we send and we have to spend billions of dollars on sending people in space, are, we gonna, are you going to suggest that, um, that it was planned that those two people would be making children or, or would you actually send, send couples to space? Or, or do you think that it's kind of an accident and the AI just lets, lets it happen? More like freedom-based or do you think the program? 
Um, I prefer to send couples to the Mars and they can, yeah, have their baby there. <laughs> That's, uh, that's interesting. Also very complicated, right? Childbirth is uh, very risky, very dangerous. Uh, the kid, like we, we've never had a child in, in space. Uh, no child has ever been born in space yet. So there are theories about how that they might develop, but the gravity is weaker. There's more radiation. So there's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, if you want to allow or encourage that, uh, what if the child dies? What if the child develops in a weird way, right? There was a talk about that by a doctor at the Mars Society. There was, Maybe yeah, yeah. if you Google doctors, online yeah. something, yeah. Actually, we can link to it after. We can. Actually, you could. Yeah, you could search it out. We have a Mars Society. Mars Society childbirth. There's a good talk. It might not. I don't remember if it was called that. Maybe videos. I'm sure there's other articles. And those guys are doing interesting work. I'm sure in one of these articles will will be about them. Or if not on YouTube, because Mars Society has all their talks there. So. I also heard that the experiment of artificial womb is on the going, but since the Earth, there is the ethical issue of um, banning growing human cells uh, outside the body um, within 14 days. So the experiment is stifled. No, sorry, I think it's, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, never mind. It's, uh, it's going to be one of these. Yeah, it's but, 21st, yeah. I know. Uh, sorry, Wendy. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I think that's going to happen. I, I agree with you, Wendy. I think we're going to have childbirth outside of the womb. Uh, that's going to happen. It obviously, it doesn't exist right now. So if you're looking at the near future, five to 10 years, maybe that's not going to be ready. Uh, I mean, that leads to all sorts of interesting issues around like uh, whose baby is it? So if you take the genes of two people, uh, is it their baby if it grows in a womb? I guess so, maybe. But what if uh, you can have all sorts of different models? So you can have the genes from two people combine and then you say, oh, biologically it's their baby, but actually maybe the baby is of the colony, right? So maybe everyone is its parent. So you can have different models. You can also have a, you can also imagine a model where you combine genes from multiple humans. So like four of them, you can combine genes from four people to make a baby. And then it's actually, you know, they'll be even more committed maybe to treat it as their kid because it actually is biologically their kid. So there's different models. If you're going to think in that direction, there's uh, don't think uh, of the current model of kind of child bearing in families, right? It can, it can end up being quite different. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After how many people's genes can you? I mean, in, in some theoretical sense, I think uh, this could turn into like uh, combined taking individual genes, right, from different people. So you could end up having a baby that's a combination from 20 different people, uh, 20,000 different people, let's say, uh, you know, because there's just it's like 25,000 genes. And, and what, you so have, you'll handpick traits that you have, want from each person. Yeah, I mean, at some point, it, Exactly, exactly. You can take genes because, you know, some people have great genes for immune, immune function, some people have great genes for athleticism, some people have great genes for memory, right? And if you take Move. all those genes from different people, like, do they work together as well? well? That, that's, like, that, that would be the magic of getting them to work together, right? But I mean, um, yeah, but maybe it's... Too Is that scientifically? Maybe, maybe it's too much detail to go into now, no? Yeah. Is there somebody else who would like to share the stories or shall we, um, shall we? Um, yeah, uh, me and Winnie, would like to go. that's okay. Uh, what's your slide number? Uh, 67? I think it, no, it's below that. This, this like, is you guys? Uh, sorry, no, it's up, it's up. Okay. 56. 56. Okay. Yeah. You can just give me signals and I and I pass your your slide. So Mark twenty sixty, you and we. Yeah. So for our project, we were inspired by Graham, uh, which some is the one we saw a few weeks ago about the human being uh, designed for a car accident. So we sort of took that idea and because our technology is bioengineering, so we thought about how can we sort of uh, change the human body so that they can 
survive on Mars. So we looked at different um, sort of genetic traits uh, of uh, different animals um, to like animals living in extreme cold weather, um, animals living in darker areas, uh, photosynthesis um, ability to combat radiation, and we sort of visualize how that looked like. Um, and then, for, so that was like last week, and this week we actually got together, um, and then we sort of thinking more about building a whole human is a bit um, hard. Uh, so I think for us, we're thinking about how we can start with something smaller. So something like, how can we augment first um, a sense of a human body? So maybe like adding a six finger that moves uh, easily or having a, an ear that we can like control to close uh, so that we can uh, avoid like dirt getting into it when we get caught in a sandstorm or something like that. Um, so yeah, so our story is basically talking, it's like a three-day journal of someone who have this um, sort of augmentation uh, and then arrives on Mars and sort of experiences with different people and how they sort of acclimatizing to that uh, climate on Mars and how they're acclimatizing also to the person, to the people around in their colony because they look very different um, from the people in their colony. So and. Then, it's, just, it's like, I think for us is that we're interested in seeing how, whether the social relationships between humans that are on Mars that are normal humans like us or humans that are augmented and how when they arrive to Mars, how that plays out. Yeah. Really cool. So what, what are some of the main augmentations? You mentioned like, uh, you know, you mentioned the ear, uh, photosynthesis, that, that's nice. Produce your own food and energy. That's always useful. Like what, what else did you think about? Um, so we think about a lot. Uh, yeah, so actually there's a, in the second paragraph here, you can sort of read a bit. So um, we have some, uh, so we have carotenoids, uh, which is to resist strong UV radiation. We use uh, something like similar to cat's eyes because Mars has less, um, uh, less light compared to Earth. So something that helps us to be able to see in the dark a bit easier. Um, and another, also something that replicates like reptiles' eyes. So a third sort of a layer in our eyes so that it prevents like a clear film that prevents dirt from getting into the eye. Uh, bigger chest to combat lower air pressure, uh, six fingers, because we actually saw a study that says that people with six fingers actually can do much more mobility tasks. So you can do a lot of tasks that requires two hands with only one hand if you have six fingers. Um, yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we came up uh, with. And uh, we also found uh, like a lot of like other like smaller genes. Uh, so there's actually a list that we found it's like 40 genes that people on Mars yeah. should have by a uh, scientist and it's all the genes like HIV resistant or like uh, that's prone to different disease. Yeah. Nice, nice. Okay, that, that's that's really cool. Um, let's see. One thought that comes to mind that to challenge you on this is radiation damages every material, right? Every kind of material, more or less. And there is uh, more of this kind of high energy radiation because there's a weaker, uh, you know, magnetic field and, and and atmosphere there to protect you from that radiation. So radiation destroys materials. And so you need some kind of, uh, so I, I think something to think about, uh, maybe less related to kind of mental well-being in the mental state, but well, related in that it will destroy, destroy the, the physical system over time is some kind of a radiation protection mechanism. If, you, if you're going down the biotech route, the biology route, you, you know, you, you should definitely have some, think about like, um, how do you deal with radiation damage? The body should be able to repair itself. Because I mean, right now there's some repair mechanisms from radiation in, um, in the DNA, for example, but they're not great, right? Um, yeah, something that we thought about as well is where, how far do we want the body? I mean, it's just something that we're still discussing is like how far do we want the body to be able to protect itself? So do we want these people to be able to walk out of Mars completely just like we walking out like 
for walk yeah, yeah, players, yeah. or do we want people to walk out with less uh, equipment required than like a normal human would? Yeah, I think, I mean, it would obviously be convenient if they can just walk outside, right? Walk outside and inside and not need a suit. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I'm, I'm just showing those images because for me, they're, they're inspiring of a potential approach is the shedding. So other, other trees will do that. Um, humans do that too. We, we lose constantly our skin. We just don't see very much, except when you clean your house and there's lots of dust. Actually, a lot of it is your, is your own skin, your dead skin. Sure, sure, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, it can come. It can take an interesting aesthetic approach because I think there's kind of like Superman, you know, like spandex suit or like naked super like six pack kind of a character is very very um, uh, explored already. Maybe there's a different aesthetic that can be uh, examined. Yeah, good point. I guess you know the shedding would have to be more than skin skin deep, right? It would. So it's not just your skin, obviously, but. It would have to be a re replacement and fixing of uh, down to the genetic level, down to the molecular and genetic level from the damage from the radiation. I guess it would look like a disease by human standards uh, to have like skin shedding. And what we see as a skin as a skin disease or like a skin rash um, might be the normal just to protect ourselves. Um, it's not very pleasant to, to watch those things, but they, they may be, uh, you know, one approach to have the body regenerate itself. Um, so because you are, you are working on the human body, uh, it's the same question that I've asked to, uh, to Wendy. Are you gonna be uh, designing the device that help to customize those humans? Or are you gonna be looking at accessories because the focus is about brain computer interface? Are you going to be focusing on oh, how do those new type of creature interact with technology? Or is there any interaction with technology? Or are you talking about purely about chemistry or biology in this case? Um, so, yeah, so that's what we've been talking today. We only talked about it today, actually, about our actual, how would that actual product look like and something that we think could be uh, suitable for this uh, course is like, maybe we look at something that maybe not doing bioengineering yet. So maybe not like, you know, like changing the human body yet, but we do something like a product that would tell, help us explore how would it feel like to have those augmentations um, on your body. So for example, like when I mentioned like a six finger, so maybe something that's like a finger that can naturally contact when you, like a normal finger or something that, how you can close your ear or something sort of similar to, or how you can like protect your eyes. So I think that's the part of that we might uh, go down on, like that route. Uh -huh. I gotta say the, the thing that I love the most about your story is that you're looking at, uh, at the, telling the story from the perspective of the alien. I think a lot of the times the story is, is told looking at people who are look different from the perspective of humans and then to make the alien look really like something that is really horrible and dangerous and threatening, almost like a uh, Frankenstein. You know, like when you look at Frankenstein or Dracula, we look at all the, the, the beauty and the beast. We typically look at the story from an external perspective. Uh, but uh, telling the story from the perspective of the alien, you know, looking back at human as being like kind of underdeveloped, you know, like uh, misadjusted, I think is very, very helpful. Uh, is a very helpful way to tell the story and very new and, and very refreshing. So if there's anything I would keep in the story, it's actually the, it's the perspective. I think it's very, very interesting. So agreed. I agree with that. But uh, on, on the other hand, if these guys are actually kind of descendants of humans, which they are, right? right. Uh, and it's still, it's still pretty, near, um, pretty near to the current time. What I'm thinking is like there'll be all this cultural kind of expectation. So if they're watching entertainment, if they're talking <laughs> to humans back on Earth, at some point, like you're going to start forming associations of, well, I'm a human, but I'm really quite different, right? Uh, so how do they deal with this mentally? Like they'll have to, you have to create a culture. You have to kind of um, encourage the, the new Martians that you've redesigned or that have, you know, um, grown there or been redesigned. There'll have to be like a whole story around that for why that's like, they shouldn't go crazy or they shouldn't go sort of like get overly upset, right? That they're, um, that they're very different. And so that, that, that's not, I don't think that's so, that's so simple, right? Um, there's this story that just I think came out yesterday 
uh, from a Pakistani, a British mm -hmm. Pakistani, or living in Scotland. And then the British government has been um, bringing back uh, the white British first before they brought back Pakistani or like Indian descent. And so um, they feel that a lot of them work in uh, 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 vital services, you know, like grocery. A lot of those uh, immigrants work in, in very important and very vital services. And so they talk about how they feel that they are being treated like alien. And then even if, they are, if, they, if the government knows that they are vital workers, uh, they are treated like underclass citizen. And so there's a whole rhetoric of racism that exists uh, in how people are treated even on earth just because they're from a different ethnicity. So I will share this article uh, uh, as a comment to you because I think it would, it would really inform you how you would see how uh, people are being treated, you know, like uh, in relationship to government even by the, well, by that's the peers. Actually not about, I'm not sure who that is. Sorry? That's actually not our slide. I'm not sure who it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this one is yours? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so I will just add as a, as a comment and then uh, you, you can, uh, oh, okay. So somebody already put the, the comments on this. Um, okay, I think for in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna paste that. Ah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna recapture, okay. Um, thanks a lot for sharing. Any more question? Oh, I just uh, have to... there. And guys, actually we have to go. We have another okay. call now. Um, yeah, no, but no this, is, this is great, like uh, de definitely a lot of progress, uh, the ideas have developed. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to say for some of the other ones, but I guess we'll go over it afterwards and try to leave some helpful and interesting comments for the rest of you, uh, for all of you. Thank you so much, Martin and Sarah. I really, I really appreciate your, your participation always so on point, so, so super exciting. So next week we'll be talking about some um, tech and introducing them, some tools they can use from their, some of their uh, shelter in place. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. To play around yeah. with, exactly. Some we'll yeah. demo a yeah. bunch of stuff. Yeah. Hopefully that'll be Great. fun. Thank you very much, guys. Great to see the progress. And yeah, we'll leave some comments and looking forward to the next one. Okay. Thank Bye you. guys. Bye bye. Take care. Good bye. luck. Okay, so I'll go just through the kind of closing comments. Um, so I've read your stories. I didn't comment on all of them. I just wanted to have a, a general kind of reading. Uh, what I've point, what I've noticed, and it's not a negative at all because I, I'm aware that this is the direction in which I, I push you, so I, I take responsibility for this, is that he was very uh, focused on the stories, and I think you've done great progress. I intentionally did not give you feedback uh, between last week and this week because I um, because I'm I, I have a certain way of thinking that's very like kind of goal oriented and trying to get stuff done, but I wanted to give you more space to keep thinking about your story. So, but I, I will give you feedback on your on your story today or tomorrow. Um, now what I'm going to ask you to uh, to bring your focus on is to uh, is to bring your focus back onto the objects or the um, or specifically how that this specific situation comes into reality. For, for example, just saying, Yui, like, how do you actually generate this human? Uh, is it like an injection? Is it test tubes? So if you prototype this, uh, is it going to be um, the the training? You're going to be like uh, showing the training devices that they use, or you're going to show the kind of um, um, or you're just really going to focus on their physique and just focus on like the, their, their biology. Um, in the case of uh, Wendy, um, are you going to be focusing on the one use, for example, of a spacesuit? Like if you use a spacesuit for, for sexual activity, like how does it look like? Um, because it's not something that's really, it's not really being designed for generally. So that's super interesting, but it's starting to look a bit deeper into the object. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I'm just going to go back into present mode. Um, so, also I want to mention that when you're telling a story, and this is the reason why we also approach this exercise from kind of like zoom in, macro vision to come zoom in out, is that we go from story to actual stories. <clears throat> so you will find that uh, when you have more than one character, it's not just the, person, the story of one person, but it's, just, it's multiple stories kind of intertwined. And typically object is also not just one object, it's an object that is part of a system of objects. And this is also why I, I referenced uh, the, 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 the system of objects by, um, by uh, Baudrillard. So your story and your objects are gonna be intertwined <coughs> with environments and characters. So as you keep developing your, your concepts, I, I just mentioned that I'd like you to maybe bring a bit more focus or choosing at least one of the objects that you want to focus your attention on. Uh, so like this, we maybe through 
developing this object, it will tell, it helps you tell the bigger, bigger stories. Um, I showed you this video already, right? Do you guys remember this video? So Tom Chi, uh, everybody remember? Yeah. Okay, so actually I want to mention a few things that I know because he's my personal mentor. So he told me some backstories that I'd like to tell you um, that he didn't mention in a, in a TED talk that's less than five minutes. So um, this uh, idea of, um, of minority report is coming from sci-fi. And as I mentioned last week, like we, can, we are using sci-fi in this course to uh, actually design future interfaces and future devices. And that's, that's, a, that's a great way to, to develop that. And now there's a whole host of people who are actually developing those and trying to be as close as they can to, um, to how this interface looks like. So you can see on the right side, this is an actual like super nerd guy who works in the lab and then he just developed the exact replica of that. Um, and uh, he's doing that with an existing product. Um, and the existing product is called, oops, is called Leap Motion. Uh, I will share this, uh, this video with you, but six minutes long, so it's a bit too long for me to, to show it to you. But Leap Motion is an existing device that you can buy today. It costs like $150 or $100. Um, and you can actually uh, manipulate, uh, you can manipulate software using just your hands. So it's, it's really good. So this is not like sci-fi, like what I'm showing to you on the left side is a commercial product. It's been out for like five years. And so you can actually track the movement fingers with two, two people. And it's, it's, very, it's very accurate. I've used it uh, quite a bit and, and, it's, and it's working very well. So, uh, but what I'd like to say is actually when they, when they developed at Google, they build that very thing. They use the motion, they use a bunch of interfaces. And what they have found is that you don't want to do that. Like when you're walking in the streets, there's two things. Like first, it's extremely socially awkward. So if you imagine you're sending an email and then to send an email, you have to do some like kind of weird gesture like this. You're not going to do that in the street. You're not going to do that into a meeting. Um, and so imagine like, I'm going to ask you like, to guess like, what do you think this lady is doing with her hands? What do you think she's uh, interfacing with? Can you take a guess? If she was using like a minority report type of interface, what do you think she would be doing? Receiving a file. <laughs> opening a file? Yeah. Yeah, she could be opening a file. I guess she could like, uh, like uh, broadening the, the size of a picture. It's not sure, but what I can tell you is that I think very few people, let's say in the MTR, would be willing to like use that kind of like massive gesture. I think it's very unlikely. And the second thing that they find is just uh, physiological. When they build this interface, they realize that if you put your arms up in the air, more than like three minutes, it starts to hurt your shoulder. It starts to strain your neck. And this is just a fact, like no matter if you are like a word, word title boxer or if you're a craft worker, uh, if you leave your hand up in the air and I invite you to do that, you're gonna feel two things. You're gonna start to feel that your hands are getting cold if you put your hands above your heart because your, your blood will have difficulties pumping all that way up. And the second is that you feel, start to feel strained and, 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 and cranky. So Minority Report works for Tom Cruise, you know, for like this kind of action movie, but in practice is just not, not, not feasible or not desirable. Um, and so um, what people say about the Google Glass is that um, you can read this article, they said that the reason why Google Glass failed was mostly a failure of marketing. I would argue that it's also a failure of market readiness. I think people culturally were not ready to, uh, to adopt such a, such a device. Um, and the reason why I argue that is because since then, Google Glass 2015, uh, oops, this is what happens when I create a link in the presentation. Um, there actually is a new product. It's by Bose and it came out last year. And basically it's most of the function of Google Glass, except it's not a visual feedback. It's an auditory feedback. Uh, but you can read your email. Uh, you can respond to call all the things that you have with the Bluetooth, except it's, it's different. Like it's cool. It's not like Google Glass, which is like super nerdy. This one is like cool looking. You look hip, you look, you know, uh, cute. And, and, and it's a commercial product and this all you know, hundreds of thousands of these devices and so it's a commercial product. So some people say like Google Glass was an utter failure. I, I look at it very differently. Like when you design products, even what you're designing right now, you know, my, some people might say like, this is really crazy and well, this is never going to happen because reason for X and Y today, but it's because people fail to project themselves in the future. Like this is eventually, it's eventually coming. 
you know, really, really wouldn't be surprised that Google Glass makes a comeback uh, once the market is more ready. So um, the assignment for next week is the, is, the, um, is the following. So not to get hung up on the immediate feedback and people saying like what you're doing is immoral or uh, is to what I call deferring judgment. You know, it's not about like what other people think, but it's more like projecting yourself in the future, abstracting maybe some of even the moral values that we have today. Just like um, uh, what Martin was saying is that, you know, the experiments we have kids in Chinese school like wearing this head on right now, maybe this is not morally accepted or people think this is weird, but in the future it might be, there might be a better version of that that have passed most of the hurdles um, and they have resolved uh, some of the uh, ethics issues around it or society has adapted and it has become the, the new normal. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do for, for next week is really, uh, again, to like, I think your story is good, to Nash, focus back your focus uh, a little bit back onto the objects and uh, try to prototype. So what I'm asking you to do is, um, like what I showed you in the Tom Chi presentation, is to make at least one low res prototype of, of what you have done. Of, of your idea. So of course, this is not gonna be like sensing your brain activity or, or so and so, this is what we're gonna be talking about next week. But even if it just fakes it, for example, like if you're talking about like making a uh, space suit, what I'd like to see when they do is to show us uh, like even a pyjama that you would have say hacked, for example. You could just take a pyjama and use a marker and draw on it. Uh, in the case of UE, maybe you know you could like um, show us like body modification or like put stickers in your face of what like uh, being a, a creature uh, that sequester um, uh, chlorophyll looks like. So I'd like you to do some one very low res experiment. Just do one low res experiment. And so what we'll do next week is that um, uh, I would like you to show uh, those low res experiments. So you can post those low res experiments that you have done on the deck. So. It doesn't have to be very long at all. Like for example, I described to Wendy, literally can take like less than an hour. You take a piece of exist existing garment, draw on it, and then play with it. You know, like if you're gonna use it for sexual purpose, like how is it different from, from like a normal pyjama? Uh, for, for you, like if you're gonna be using this on, on your skin, like uh, how is it looking? You can also build on what you have done in the previous, um, in the previous brief. You've done something with the uh, agar agar. Maybe you can go and continue in this, in this line of, of work. So assignment for next week is low res prototype. Um, I just want to also stress why we push you in this direction. So the idea is that um, we're going to have next week where we can give you some feedback and we can give you some key technology that you can use to prototype. And then you're going to have a public holiday. So there'll be one week where we don't have uh, class. But the week after, we are uh, expecting to have Mr. Zubrin to come and talk to you guys. And so when he comes, you want to use that, that chance to speak to like the world most eminent specialist about Mars, not just to show some drawings, but also to show that you're starting to experiment in this direction. And so you want to you wanna jump in and uh, between this week and next week to start to prototype so that this you have at least another week to continue to refine your prototype. So when you show something to Mr. Zubrin, he would see, wow, those young people are not only talking about it because everybody's talking about it, but they start to experiment and do something that is more tangible. And that's going to be critical because that session with Mr. Zubrin on May 7 is going to be before a very long stretch of time, three weeks, so about a month, when we're not going to see each other um, on, I mean, we, we, I, can, I can host office hours, but um, you really want to use that time to refine your, your, your prototype. So, um, yeah, so this, this is the reason why, why instead of putting the deadline to be at the very end of the course, this is basically like think of May 7 as your deadline. So at this, whatever you get as feedback, uh, you can then use that feedback to then refine your, 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 your product or your service or your, or your device or your, or your software. So like, by the end of the semester, you would have something really amazing that's informed by, re, by discussion with, um, with specialists. So to repeat, the, um, the, uh, the brief is to make a low res, uh, low res prototype. So uh, low res, uh, I, should, I should write it not just object, but low res prototype. Do you have any, any question? Hello? Do you have any questions? No, no questions? 
See, yeah. just, just want to clarify yes. Uh, yes. seeing Erica and I's work because, yes. yeah, it's not on the uh, timeline. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. you posted. You, maybe you posted this very last minute, so I might have missed it. Uh, let me go. Where is it? Oh, here. No, that's um, not mine. Yeah. D this one. Yeah. These. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. I apologize. So um, I'll definitely read all of your text and give you individual. Well, sorry, group feedback. Um, so I would definitely uh, read through it. I, I apologize, I, mi I missed it in the in the timeline, but I would definitely uh, work on it. Uh, any feedback or question about the the course? Or about, the about um, next next week? Do Do you change the class to Wednesday, or if it's just a typo? Because first day is public holiday, I guess, and it should be the first day for April. Uh, let me double check that. So next class. Oh, you are correct. Is this? Is this? Um... Okay, so it means that is the the next class is the is the one where we don't have class, right? And the next one is the public holiday. Okay, thank you so much for, for pointing this out. That's pretty important. <laughs> so then I suppose uh, the 29 is the, is the public holiday. It's like this, right? So this is the public holiday. And then the, 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 the following week is when we will actually have that session. Is that correct? I think so. Maybe. Okay. Thank you very much for pointing this out, and I and I need to. Um, well, that's that's a good news because then that leaves you one more week to actually work on the on the prototype, right? Caesar, I think your dates are wrong because <laughs> week thirteen is April twenty ninth, and week fourteen is May first, and that's like two days of difference. Could you correct it? Uh, I may not be understanding fully what uh, the, the the mistake that um, you're pointing out. Could you go in yeah, the document um, and, and correct it? Oh, thank you. Um, so wait a second. So the the public holiday is the thirtieth and the first, but the next session is the the 7th, right? 7th of May. So here it should be May 7th, isn't it? I'm confused. The, today we are the 23rd of April. Yeah. Oh, Caesar, I think next. I added another like week into your brief. Okay, Did yeah, you, there's, there's like an the extra week. Class should be on the 30th, so the t week 13 part should be removed. I think that's the only issue. So, okay. Yeah. So it means that we, do we have a session before we talk to Zubrin? No. So it means that the next session you're presenting directly to Zubrin, which is May 7th. I mean, the other reality is that even if there's a public holiday, we could still hold the class if you, if you guys would be willing to do that. Um, I don't want to force you obviously to, to, to work, um, but given that if the next session is going to be with like the worst, most eminent Mars specialist, I think it'd be a bit of a shame if, if you don't get a, a shot at doing your best work. What do you guys think? Would you be willing to do one more session or? Can I have a show of hands? And I will just go with a, with a democratic decision, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, all the students rep, so it's Yui and Anson. Um, so do, what do you guys feel? Like personally, I'm willing to work even on public holiday, I don't mind, because I, I wanna make sure that you do the, your, your best possible work. So, um, so raise your hand if you want to have an extra session, so that this uh, Dira and Martin can introduce you to the tools. Um, if you want to have a public holiday and you'd rather have a week off, uh, then keep your hands down. So raise your hand if you would be willing to have another session. Um, 
Caesar, I wanted to ask if it's possible for it be a pre-recorded session. It would be recorded. Okay, so I think I think I have majority of people who want to have the session. So what we'll do is that we will host the session and we will record it. So if you're not attending on the day, then you're welcome to, to watch it. Okay, because I, I don't know if I can on that day. I yeah, totally understand. And, uh, and that's another, another advantage of having sessions recorded is that uh, it's becoming more flexible. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so uh, next session, low-res prototype uh, in real world, not just illustration of whatever you are thinking to, to be the, the, the device or the service. Um, I look forward to see you next week. Bye-bye.